welcome to the September 21st regular meeting of this Hopkinton School Committee. I will ask you to um, stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, well welcome. We have several guests tonight, which is always our favorite way to start a meeting. Um, so I'll read through the agenda really quickly, and then we will um, let some of our guests entertain us. We'll start with recognitions, uh, followed by public comments. <coughs> we have several reports to the school committee, the student council report, uh, several liaison reports, an overview of our cross-country course progress by Mr. Kilduff, a report about technology from Mr. Ghosh, um, and then Dr. McLeod and I will each give our reports. Under new business, we'll be looking at school committee policy JLA wellness, as well as school committee policy BEDH public participation at committee meetings. Um, we will review the community Preservation Committee application submitted for the athletic fields. Uh, we'll have a discussion about changing our approval of counts payable warrant um, process. And then under old business, we'll take a, another look at school committee policy GCRD related to tutoring, as well as school committee <coughs> policy JH student attendance. Um, we will then have a discussion about our superintendent search process and have our second opportunity for public comment. Following that, we will have items by consensus, and um, that's everything that we have going on tonight. So why don't I turn it over to you to get started with the recognitions? Well, we're delighted tonight um, to, to um, have Mr. Hay join us. Mr. Hay is our subject matter leader, leader for mu our music program. Um, and he has a couple of very special guests with us tonight, so I'll turn it over to you. Over here. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, tonight we are recognizing uh, Rachel Chen and Dan Moreno, both uh, two of our seniors who have, through the years, worked their way through district and to all state, and last year were invited to try out for the National Association for Music Education National Concert Ensembles. Wow. Um, they put together some videos, uh, sent them in for adjudication. In July, we were notified that they were both selected as alternates. And right before school began, Rachel was selected to participate. So we have two students who basically have work their way up to be within the top 200 young musicians in the <coughs> form of concert band uh, in the United States. Wow. So awesome. tonight we'd like to recognize Rachel and Dan for their accomplishments. Thank you. That's wow. I know. You guys deserve applause. <laughs> and you're going to play something for us? Oh, okay. Awesome. Oh, okay. <laughs> what are you going to play? Oh, the thanks a favorite moment yeah. at a recognitions at school committee that was just wonderful 
This is just this wonderful. This is definitely at the top of the list. You could just yes. see everybody beaming here behind you. So that was just so <laughs> fabulous. We could just listen to you all night. Thank you so much. That was fantastic. Congratulations. Congratulations. That's an amazing accomplishment, and you just make us look so good. So thank <laughs> you very much. Well done. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you both for your time. Thank you. Wow. Now everything that has to follow that. I know. Yeah. <laughs> Who wants to go after that? <laughs> well, Alexis and Meg have a little act. Ah. So. All right. Um, great. Next, I'd like to invite Alexis Miller and Meg Tyler to come up and join us. Wonderful. Uh, yeah. <laughs> We've seen you at those dances, Alexa. Yeah, Alexis, yes. So as usual, um, we like to invite the um, Hawkington Education Foundation on an annual basis to come to your meetings um, to highlight the wonderful things that they do, um, to show our appreciation for all that you do. Uh, and I think what I'd like you to do is, is highlight some of the exciting opportunities that you've brought to the schools for this year. Um, what I want to point out to the school committee is that I think it's important to recognize that the types of grants that are being um, awarded are not only technology, which is sometimes what people think when they think HEF, um, but really innovation and opportunity um, for the schools to try something um, that they might otherwise not have been able to try. That can then inform our thinking around uh, future budget decisions, um, opportunities for students, and um, it's always, we're always waiting with anticipation to see what they'll be each year. So with that, I'll turn it over to you to, um, first of all, of course, to thank you for being here, but to give us an overview, perhaps, of the kinds of things that were awarded this year. Thank you. That was a fabulous introduction. Um, I'm just going to, before I start about what we've done this year, I just want to jump on what um, Kathy just said about it. We love to do pilot programs or something unique, and even if it fails, we feel like we did our duty because now it's something you don't have to invest in for the schools. Um, one recent grant that was not this year, the year before, we did a math lab. We call it the Innovation Lab at the high school. And they redesigned how they did the classrooms, a lot of flexible grouping, high tables, low tables, something similar to what's been done at the library so that they could do a lot more collaboration in the math classroom. And apparently there's quite the um, fighting over who gets to teach mm -hmm. in that room now. So something like that is a great concept if you need to invest in chairs and, and desks again. Is that another option? So it was, it was a nice opportunity for us to try something that you might not have been had the budget for in the past. Um, so. Thank you for inviting us here. We really appreciate it. Um, for those of you that are new to the school committee, um, we partner also with the PTA, but our goal is to fund innovative things for the teachers. Teachers, administration, anyone in the school can write an application for a grant to us, and then we give them money to do something that follows along with the curriculum. It doesn't go against the district plan, but maybe just kind of goes in a slightly different direction. Our goal is, uh, ideally to give money as much as we can to the schools, but really to inspire the children. Um, we want them to figure out if it's a new way to learn or something different for them. So um, some of the grants that we funded this past year are some of my very favorite, and I'll be short because I know that you have an ice cream date for later, <laughs> so I don't want to interfere. Um, so the handouts that I gave you have a couple things in there, just some general information about us for those that are not familiar with us, um, kind of a summary of the PTA and, and have why we're the same and different, um, and then a breakdown of the grants. So um, the first grant that's on there is a, a, land, a breakout box, um, and I love this because I have children that are in middle school and high school, and they do a lot of collaboration on projects. But in the younger grades, they don't do as much, and they don't really learn those skills. They're kind of thrown into it when they're older. So the breakout boxes are a really fun way for them to start working on collaboration at the younger grade levels. Um, it's subject, it, they have hundreds of different options for that. It goes along with whatever curriculum they're working on in any subject that they want. This one in particular was just a third grade teacher. I believe she was planning to use it mostly for social studies, but it can be anything. Um, and they have to work together to solve a puzzle, kind of like a, a breakout room or those game things that you go to. So it's a great way for them to learn collaboration and, and start that process. And the kids think it's a fun game, which that's great. If they can make learning fun, it's fabulous. Um, also, at the Elmwood School, we did um, a supplement to the science curriculum. They have some outside people coming in to do some hands-on classes. That's going to help the teachers learn some new ways to do labs at the younger grades um, and just accentuate the, um, 
the lessons that they're already doing. Um, the bibliotherapy is something that Hopkins has worked really hard on. They're doing diversity and inclusion. Um, that's been a big promotion since they've had a new principal, and this supplements that. They have their morning meetings, and they get to read stories about somebody that either learns slightly different but looks the same or looks different but thinks the same as you and, and gives them just another way to put themselves in someone else's shoes so that they can understand them better. Um, the next two, um, I have some uh, personal feedback from my daughter about this because she's already been able to use it. I'm really excited. Um, one of the comments that I've heard from parents is that there's not as much um, differentiation in some of the middle school classrooms because they don't have the ability to do that. They're all grouped together. Um, both Membeam and No Red Ink, which are two different grants, but similar because they both work with the English department, they're online learning. So instead of doing vocabulary, everybody gets a list, they take a test, they go home, they study the words, and then they come back and they, I mean, they pre-test, they study, and then they do their test. Um, this allows them to do it on their own time. They have deadlines for their work, but if they know the word, they're moved on to a higher level word. Um, and if they don't know the word, then they can go back and they do slightly less challenging words to build them up. All of the sentences are structured based on things that the students say. If they are a huge fan of SpongeBob SquarePants, then they're going to get a whole bunch of under the scenes SpongeBob related sentences. If they're a big fan of horses, then that's what their lessons are going to be circulated around so that they'll be able to be more enthusiastic about doing vocabulary, which traditionally is not always people's favorite part of the day. Um, but it does a really great job. They do it scheduled by the teacher. The teacher sees all the steps that they're doing on their own, but the kids work on it by themselves at their own speed. Um, and then No Rate Inc. is very similar, um, but it's grammar instruction. So there is not currently curriculum for time for grammar instruction at the middle school. They do it as part of the English curriculum, but it's not a specific taught subject. So they feel like they're lacking a little there. And this is going to supplement, because the kids will get the grammar lesson on their own, again, it'll be assigned for them with deadlines, but they do it at their own speed with a lot of their own interests brought into the curriculum that they're learning. Um, and my daughter, who is a good learner and enjoys school, was really enthusiastic about Membean, and um, I was excited to see how much fun she was having doing something that traditionally is not her favorite part of schoolwork. So I was excited about that one. I love it when I get to see my kids actually benefit from a grant we were part of. Um, and then the last one that we did this year um, is building a thinking classroom. And again, it goes ties a lot back into the collaboration, which is something that we've been working. We're seeing a lot of grants about that lately. Um, basically, in math class, it's not always about you sitting down, adding up a problem together, and that's it. They put things on the board. They work together. They throw out answers. Um, so this created kind of a wall of boards for them to work on at different levels and different times. They're movable, so they can go in and out of classrooms if they need them to be, um, but it allows the kids to interact with each other a little bit more as they go through it. Um, so we don gave um, $28,260 this year in grants. Um, we love to give more than that. It all depends on what we can get in um, and what grants we receive. Um, we have several events coming up that you may or may not know about already. Um, so I'll just give you a quick summary. We do a trivia night in the fall. We do a gala of some sort with a silent auction in the spring, and then our golf ball drop in the spring. Um, we supplement that with the marathon runner that we have, hopefully every year, kind of depends. And um, our Thank Our Teacher program, which is actually a really fabulous fundraiser. It's both in right before the winter break and then right before school ends in the fall, I mean in the spring. and. Um, Basically, people donate to us, write down however many teachers they want, and we send the teachers a thank you card. We've heard some really fabulous feedback from the teachers on that, um, and that's one of our best fundraisers, so we really enjoy it. So, we said all that. Thank you all so much. For Does anyone have any questions for me? Do you have a date for the trivia night? The trivia night is um, either the 19th or the 18th of October. It's a Thursday, and whatever that Thursday is, the 18th or the 19th, that's the date. Thank you. I apologize, I don't recall. It is the 19th. Thank it you. It is the 19th. 19th. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. I, I, we'll reschedule our meeting and come to trivia night. Yeah. I know. <laughs> well, actually, um, we did sell out, and we are time. trying to. <laughs> Too bad. You can't. <laughs> but we are trying to get another date. So one of the considerations for the second date was to make sure it wasn't a school committee night. Thank you. Kelly Knight had an upset with problems with that last year, so <laughs> we have to. We try to accommodate. So yeah, Thank you. leave the leave open the opportunity for us to humiliate ourselves. That'd be. <laughs> That'd be great. Oh, as a group, you guys would do fabulous. <laughs> mm. The, the <laughs> teachers are always a lot of fun. The teacher groups that come, they are very entertaining. They're well, a lot of fun. 
you guys put so much time and energy into all of this, and it's really uh, it's, it's such great benefit to the schools. I, I really these are such clever and creative. Um, grants that that you you know that were applied for this year I, and I mean particularly I love this the neurodiversity one I think that that's um, you know it's even just a small grant but an example of a huge impact huge impact um, and so you know but all of them are, are tremendous and it's a great I know the teachers really have caught on to the fact that they can take advantage of applying for these grants and do something a little bit out of the box and exciting for them um, you know as opposed to finding out what's what we dished onto their plate this year or whatever so uh, is a great opportunity and thank you all so much for the amount I know it's a huge amount of time and effort but um, certainly we're so grateful to you for that very welcome we love we love seeing the results of the grants. It's so much fun to have my kids come and say, oh, this was so much fun for me. So it's awesome. Fabulous grants, and so appreciate how much work goes into the fundraising behind all of it. So <laughs> I'm fortunate that there's a lot of people that help. We <laughs> not do it alone. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah, I Thank have you. one question for you. Sure. Now, do you leave it to the teachers to come up with, um, you know, what is it that they're looking for? Do you have any suggestions for them on the possibilities? We, we leave it to the teachers. Um, we do have some teachers that have written a lot of grants in the past or have lots of ideas, and we do try to speak to some of the newer teachers and, and direct them so they can get some guidance from that, but we don't offer suggestions at all. This completely comes from within a lot of times they'll go to um, some sort of conference and come back with it or talk to another teacher in another school district and find something exciting or um, sometimes it's just a teacher that feels like they're missing something and creates it on their own so lots of different ways to come up with it it's great what you're doing it's very very exciting and kudos to all the teachers also who applied I see uh, Miss Noreen Sloan has gotten two grants. Very excited for her. Yes. So it's fun. There's lots of different um, opportunities. I think she co-wrote the grant with a couple people in the English department at the middle school, but it's still, we do see a lot of repeat teachers. That's, that's awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much, both Thank of you. you. You're more than welcome to stay for the rest of our meeting if you like. Do but nice we don't expect you to. <laughs> if you, yes, if you stick around and we make it before they close, Beach. absolutely. <laughs> Offers a very slim chance. A very slim chance. <laughs> thank you but very much for inviting cool. us. And thank you all for your support. Absolutely. This is fantastic. Thank you. And now okay. we have our. Oh, you're definitely in. I see we have students who I yes. assume are here from yes, Student Council. Yes, we do. Do we I have their names okay. if you'd like yep, to invite ahead. them up? Yep. So we have Young Wang and Daniel Logan. Come on up, please. Oh, and once again, I skipped right over public comment. Okay, sorry. While we'll they are coming up, here. yes. Okay. If, if anybody is here from the public that would like to comment, you're more than welcome to come up before the boys sit down. But I think we've, we have no <coughs> so thank you. So we'll just okay. move right along. Sorry about that. And so Young and Daniel are both juniors, and I asked them if they were going to be here at every meeting, and they said just like last year that there, there would be, people would be taking turns to come. Yeah. Um, so we're really pleased this is the first, our first meeting that we've had student representation this year. Um, and we are always really pleased when you take the time to come. So thank you for being here tonight. No Thanks. So um, I guess I'll get started. Yeah, um, that'd be great. Kicking off, school's been great so far. Um, student Council itself, we've had a lot of volunteer opportunities. Major ones from Student Council include the Mother and uh, Son movie night from the, at the Y. And another one is uh, Live for Evan, mm -hmm. the 5K race. And uh, recently we had the family day, which are, uh, I believe we had over 100 volunteers, mm -hmm. yeah. which is great. So uh, it's great to get the student body involved in uh, helping out in the community. Mm -hmm. And uh, within student council, we have had, just talk about pep rally. Pep rally is coming up in, I believe, three weeks. So it's coming up quick. And um, <laughs> th this year, I think it's going to be great. Um, we've chose the spirit days, but we're going to keep that on the confidentiality okay. and then notice because we don't want anybody to be mad yeah so we'll we'll see and um i think the seniors will do the opposite of whatever we choose so it'll be nice to see how it goes around in the school and see everyone walking around with their school pride but um one thing we're really proud of is we set out um to help out hurricane harvey and irma and the devastation that those hurricanes caused and um within back to school night and sitting at at, at outside the cafeteria during lunch, we raised over $500, and we're planning to get that doubled by, I believe, the spoon. Mm -hmm. So that brings nice. us to about $1,000. So that's that's great. It's mm -hmm. fabulous. Yeah. 
and we've made a lot of progress not only in the student council but yeah. also school wise so I'm really pleased to announce that our athletic teams uh, have been made have been making incredible progress uh, of our teams uh, the football team and the cross country team are both undefeated in their seasons which is excellent I'm really proud to hear that and uh, the field hockey team is also having an incredible season as well concludes what we have for you today. Yeah. So thank you so, so much. I just wanted to start here. Sorry, sorry, John. Good. Just to add to the report on the volunteerism that I, I think it, you always, the, the, the students always come around and typically it's in response to a request that you don't necessarily have a lot of time to prepare for. So I believe the request for your assistance for this most recent um, family day, you, you only got it like on Wednesday. And the fact that there were a hundred of you that were able to find time on a Friday night just speaks to your school spirit and you know your giving back to the community. And I just want to acknowledge that above and beyond the fact that there were a hundred there. There were a hundred there that, that came on very short notice just because you were asked to. Um, so thank you. And, and I would add too, having been there, that we're extremely engaged. They weren't yeah. just there you know, to, to be there, I know in particular, I went to the um, HPTA tent where they had a uh, cardboard box obstacle course and the student volunteers that were there were actively helping the kids oh. build and extend the maze. Um, so it's it's great to see not only, again, that they do show up on short notice, but that the students are, are always are very, very engaged in their volunteering at these events. So it's great to see. Yeah, I echo what John said. We had every booth we went to, my, my son who's only eight, Seven, eight. He uh, just turned eight. Sorry. Um, he he uh, <laughs> he was like, "Those are high school kids. Those are high school kids." So he Aww. yeah, it was very you know the, the the little kids really looked up to the high school kids that were working a lot of the booths, and it was great. It was really really cool to see. Well, and Mina and I both volunteer at the senior center, and people stop us there all the time. It means a tremendous amount to them to see kids you know giving back to the community and. Um, feeling connected and engaged in the community so I mean it's just you guys do a great job representing the school and um, you know just great examples of the great kids that we have that go here and so thank you I hope you're gonna come back I hope we were oh, we will. nice Call enough to you <laughs> <laughs> it was a talk of ice cream I'm just saying so, if you can um, hold out <laughs> yeah you got to stick around till the end of the meeting for that but um, so you're welcome to stay if you like but I assume you probably have homework yep. or <laughs> more interesting things to do so thank you very much for coming and we look forward to seeing you again of course yeah. thank you okay. so thank much. you thank you, thank you. All right, so um, should we maybe do go out of order and do Mr. Kilda first? Sure, that'd be so, great. Mr. Kilda, would you like to come up and talk to us about the cross country overview? While he's coming up, is it okay if I just say that? So Mr. Kilduff is here again tonight, and I want him to know as he approaches that we watch each other's pens, Mr. Kilduff, when we are using those beautiful pens that you gave us at the last meeting. And we, they are wonderful. But Jean and I were both using ours the other day and making sure that neither walked off with each other. So you are always so generous with your time and with your ideas um, for the school district. and. Um, this latest one is an update and an overview of where we are with the cross country um, trail. And I'll turn it over to you and then, then I might have a comment after. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, two things. Uh, first being, you know, I've spent some time over the last few months, I, I seem to be bumping into this concept of courageous leaders. Uh, and when I, when I heard uh, a few months ago that my favorite superintendent ha had made some really terrific life decisions, I really I was pretty sad, and I I, I really I I, exam I I thought about that a lot, and I couldn't quite figure out what the emotion was about, but I think besides being a courageous leader, there's there's such a concept of leaders of consequence, and I think that's what that's what. Uh, that's what you brought to the district. And I'm, I, I, t I take the risk of doing that, uh, of saying this tonight, because I don't know where I'll be two weeks from now, and maybe we'll never get to say this again. But uh, I'm tired of missing those opportunities. The, the, the impact um, that Kathy's had on this district is really phenomenal, as witnessed by two of her colleagues right to her, her right. Uh, and this, it, it, it really does take 
courage, but also to translate that into consequence, not all of us get to do. So I'm pretty sad about that. On the other hand, thrilled for her. And I think the best thing we can say is because of the educational leaders that, that you have brought to the district, I think you're going to get great candidates looking at this job. So that's the upside. Yeah. Uh, and I, I think that's really important. And I didn't want tonight to go by without saying that to you directly. Um, she's terrific. Uh, and it's fantastic. Yeah. So let's talk about uh, let's talk about the cross country course. Uh, you you received in your packet um, a little overview of the course. We don't have to go through this through that, but the objectives of creating a cross country course behind the middle and the high school were pretty simple. Uh, we wanted to create a true cross country course, uh, and that means it runs over uh, various surfaces. Uh, we wanted to uh, we wanted to create something that was viewer friendly. Uh, so when you, uh, when parents come and, and, and fellow students come and watch uh, their colleagues run, they'll be able to not just see the start and the finish of the race, people dis disappear into the woods. Uh, the, the first phase of this course, which the middle school will run on, there are about four or five options, or four or five opportunities for parents and spectators to see the students run. Um, so we've, we've met that objective. We also wanted to create something that, uh, that the community could use. There are, already, there are already people walking on the course and connecting with the center trail and that sort of thing. And then finally, uh, heaven forbid, we wanted to create a competitive advantage for our students. Uh, and I think this first phase will in, will in fact do that. Uh, the contributors, as you know, are important. This is a unique partnership between the school district, the BAA, and the 26.2 Foundation. I can tell you the BA doesn't have this kind of relationship with any other district uh, in Massachusetts, let alone along the race course. So that's pretty neat. Uh, we're looking, uh, the, the, the middle school uh, will compete on the course three times this year. We're targeting October 12th for a sort of a kickoff ribbon cutting something, despite the fact that they're going to start to run on it next week. Um, we think that'll be fun, and we think they, they deserve it. And then finally, um, we, we never think about these kinds of things, but in order to do a, a sort of a neat and, and kind of fun cross-country course, you need little flags and direction signs and, and, and that sort of thing, and then shoots, um, and that takes some, some resources. So um, we decided, the 26.2 Foundation decided that the kids deserve that. So I have um, a, uh, a little, some funds that will help offset that. And as I, I said to your very terrific athletic director recently, uh, if, if she gets excited and the coaches get excited and they need more banners or whatever, uh, we're committed to, to helping out. So we really appreciate this. This is a, this, in terms of Hopkins Marathon footprint, one of the key elements, the key elements uh, are the schools. And I think we, uh, we sometimes don't do nearly a good enough job in, in spreading that story uh, to the world. And I can tell you, from the foundation's point of view, uh, we're going to ratchet up that aggressiveness. Uh, we're going to take this story and the, the work that we do uh, with the schools, uh, not only in a marathon Greece, uh, but Dimitri now, uh, Dimitri Kirakidis, who some of you know, uh, has invited us to Cyprus later this year. Uh, to specifically talk about how we've taken his father's story uh, and driven it down through the through the district, so this is all good for all of us. Yeah. Uh, we appreciate the we really do appreciate the, the collaboration. You know, we can say this all we want, but this this willingness to collaborate, and I mean, sometimes it gets a little tough because we view the world differently than all of you do. But that it gets worked out, and the willingness for people to do that cannot be underestimated. So it really is a privilege to, uh, it's a privilege. And I, for one, wish you the best of luck in the selection process because I don't know how you're gonna replicate what you got. So good luck. You better go get that money. I know, yeah. And this is for you, here. Well, thank you. Does anybody have questions or? Uh, I don't have a question. I was gonna make a, a I think that comment. more than a um, question. <laughs> thank you very so, much. 
I mean, I do I do joke that we love when Tim comes to meetings because he always brings always. something. But I, seriously, I thought this time I was going to complain that you didn't. You pull it out of your pocket. <laughs> um, you talked about the collaboration. Yes. Um, and I think that there is a tremendous yeah, amount of, of collaboration that goes on. Um, and, and it benefits the community. But I also want to recognize your role in that collaboration because you said that we may see the world differently from, from these seats than, than you might, but I don't find that to be true. I think that whenever we can partner with a community member who recognizes that the most important thing is that we are all here volunteering our time, yourself included, who volunteers far more than, than us even, um, to benefit the community and specifically benefit the students. And that's why this cross-country course, when you, since you and Mr. Lagoy and Mr. Davenport came the first time, I have learned more about what a cross-country course is um, than I ever thought possible. But it's going to be a tremendous asset to our town, our athletic program. Um, and I want to specifically call out the, the collaboration that yourself and Mr. Lagoy have done with our athletic director, uh, Ms. King, as we're thinking about this turf field complex. At some point, somebody realized that this is going to run right through where we're planning to put this this turf field. But the work that's been done to make sure that it's not only they don't get in each other's way, but they're complementary to the vision that we have for athletic facilities that are going to benefit our students is great. So uh, again, thank you for for your constant partnership and sponsorship of these these efforts that we have with the schools, and and I'm really excited about. Um, this is yet another gem that we can add to that athletic program. Thank you. I, I have to say, I, I mean, I echo everything John said, yes, yes. and I think, um, you know, you're the glue that that pulls all these things together. And you, I mean, the, the opportunities that you've brought to our students in the classroom and on the field um, and in the town are really remarkable. You, you really are the driver of bringing the whole world to Hopkinton every year, and that's just an enormous benefit to our kids, especially in this ever-shrinking global universe that we live in. Um, and I, I have to say, you know, from the athletic field standpoint, our, our committee was created to look at putting turf on those fields and in talking with the committee about the wonderful opportunity to have the cross country course really wrapping its arms around the fields. We we have been careful in all of our um, our social media to call it an athletic complex project because it's so much more than one field and so much more than you know one course and just the opportunity to work with you and bring all of those things together. I was standing down there the other day and just really was overcome by what a tremendous facility and complex and um, just opportunity it is just for the whole town not just for the students so I, I we really cannot thank you enough we always joke that you give us money and pens every time you show up but you've given the town and the students in the town so much more than that and we're just the vehicle sometimes but um, but thank you so much for everything that you've done and please don't invite me to run on the course <laughs> when you open it You'll have an opportunity to know enough. I'll walk. I've walked on it. Us. That's my speed. Well, thank you. We're, thank you all for listening. Appreciate the opportunity to, to to dialogue. We'll keep we'll keep at it as long as we possibly can, and keep doing the good work that you're doing. I just want to say this is my first time interacting with you, and I think your words are so inspirational. What you said about Dr. McLeod, uh, you know, it comes clearly from you know you're feeling very genuinely about that, and so true, and put so beautifully. And likewise about collaboration. Very, very inspired. Thank you. Okay, I'm going. Thank home. you very All much. Right, right. Only Grace tonight. Oh, gosh. <laughs> you're, not gonna, you're not going to stay for the possibility of oh. ice cream? He Grace. knows it's All not right. going to come to pass. Yeah. He knows we're not going to be done in time. We wrap <laughs> everything up in like 55 that. minutes is slim. Thank you, Tim. We're not going to make it. Um, we will keep you posted on the ribbon cutting, but hopefully October the 12th awesome. will be the date. That's, That's the date fantastic. that we're we're planning for it will be the cross country the middle school cross country team's final home event so our thinking was that we wanted it to be an actual event and then following that we would have some guest runners some elite runners the BAA would be invited to come etc so it should be an exciting awesome. exciting event chance. we just met this week um, to talk about it all so it, it is yet to be finalized but we'll keep you posted it's exciting mm -hmm. 
Should we take Mr. Ghosh next so he doesn't have to stick around and then we can go back to our regular schedule? Absolutely. Okay. Ashok, would you like to go next so you don't have to sit and listen to the rest of our liaison reports? <laughs> Are I mean, you you're already here. Grace? Are you ready? Yeah, I think as long as the projector Okay. And since you're here, we're hoping <laughs> someone can make a technology report if it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> but we could chat while he's doing that. Yeah, so do you want to set us up? Um, right, yes, I'd love to set you up. So, in fact, I was just telling Susan that we had a bite to eat before the meeting tonight, the three of us, and um, I was giving her a little background on the technology report and basically um, explaining that this was, a, this was a, a plan, a strategic plan that Ashok put together to go along with the school committee's strategic plan. Um, and it's been a while since he's updated the school committee in terms of the things that he's accomplished towards the plan, um, but also recognizing that we have two new school committee members who probably haven't even seen the original. Maybe you have, because knowing as much as how much you both research, maybe you have. Have you? No. No? I'll admit it. The original te plan. technology the plan? plan? You're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, tonight, Ashok is going to review, you know, where, where it's come from, where he is in the plan, give you a little bit of a preview of what you might expect um, in the upcoming budget deliberations. And with that, I will turn it over to Mr. Ghosh. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for having me. Um, I think the goal really today is to talk, talk a little bit about the past and where we've come over the last few years with technology and then to try to set the stage for where we're going to go um, this year and over the next uh, few years. Um, so just to start with a little bit of uh, our vision, because I think, uh, well, we're connection. Uh, I think it's important. I, I try to pull this up when I'm working with teachers or administrators to try to kind of highlight really what the true meaning is behind having technology in the district. So technology aims to enhance student learning by creating personalized student-centered learning environments where every student has equal access to the curriculum. However, it's the district's understanding that not all curriculum is improved with the use of technology. Technology needs to be used to enhance the learning when appropriate and when it helps students reach specific learning outcomes. Therefore, the district fully supports a balanced approach of technology integration and more classical educational strategies. So I always try to bring this up when working with um, with people and just try to reiterate that it's not always about the devices and the hardware, but it's really more about aligning what we're doing strategically and how it's best going to help students in the classroom. So, so the past, <laughs> a little humor. You had a little uh, fanny, fanny pack that I, I found hilarious. I was looking at old pictures and I actually had a fanny pack traveling somewhere, so it's not that long ago. But I thought I'd start by talking a little bit about where the district was uh, five years ago and what we've kind of accomplished over the last five years. Uh, when I first took over, the district was kind of in the, in the process of centralizing the data center at the high school and had worked to try to connect all of the buildings uh, and the town buildings with uh, fiber. Uh, so that was a project that really started about seven years ago, a little longer, and um, it, it now kind of is centralized in the high school. All the buildings are connected to that data center. Uh, they all have high-speed fiber connections. Uh, when I first started it, we were on a typical business uh, Verizon plan with maybe only 300 megabytes of connectivity for our internet services. Uh, as of today, we're at one gigabytes as far as the fiber connectivity that we have coming to uh, the district, which is great. So we don't have a lot of limit when it comes to bandwidth uh, in the district. Uh, we used to have old phones. We moved over the last three years across the district uh, in coordination with the town to have uh, VoIP phone systems. Uh, throughout all of the buildings. Uh, and the nice thing about that is we're now in a centralized directory, uh, even with the town, so it's much easier to pick up and find somebody in another department or another building. So it's really helped bring the, the buildings together uh, for day-to-day -day use, but also uh, in emergency situations. So that's been really helpful. Uh, for the last two years, three years, we've really been working on improving the security systems. Uh, so it's been uh, a series of capital projects that we've worked on uh, in the district. Uh, the first being um, really trying to clean up some of the alarm systems, both during the day and at night. Um, we've had shorter amounts of staff, so when we talk about tech integration staff, we've kind of come from three technicians you'll see and three tech integration teachers uh, to more over the last couple of years. Uh, we've really hadn't put enough time and training uh, into our technicians, so uh, five years ago, 
the technicians, we might have had one Apple certified tech, for example. Uh, so they weren't really experts in a lot of the systems that we were utilizing. Um, we didn't have consistent Wi-Fi, and some of the buildings didn't have Wi-Fi throughout uh, the district. Um, we didn't have remote services, so a technician couldn't remotely log in to a teacher to help them. They'd have to go down there and work with them individually. Um, we didn't have consistent lease cycles, uh, so equipment wasn't being purchased on a regular basis. So equipment would get old and it'd be harder to replace. Uh, we didn't have one-to-one -one programs uh, in place. Uh, and then electronic evaluation systems are relatively new over the last couple of years for teachers. Uh, and really no online registration uh, processes for uh, enrolling students or for new registrations. So it's, it's been a busy five years. Um, and today, a lot of the opposite is true based on, on the list you've just seen. So we put a lot of these things into place. I think the biggest uh, takeaway is that we've really gone from an environment that wasn't truly dependable or stable five years ago where teachers couldn't necessarily depend on those services in a day-to-day -day environment, where today uh, they can. Uh, so there's not as many complaints really about downtime or no internet connectivity. I mean, it happens from time to time, but it's a much more stable business where teachers and people can kind of do their work on a regular basis. So that's been a huge change in the last you know, seven years. Um, we've obviously increased our one-to-one -one environment. So uh, currently we're one-to-one -one grades four through 12. Um, and we'll talk more about that in a bit. Um, we've got centralized security platform in place. That's kind of a shared database. Uh, so we have access controllers or key fobs for each door, uh, which are controlled centrally. Uh, so if a key fob gets lost, we have a way to quickly turn it off and, and get rid of it, and it's much easier to, to replace. Um, we now have uh, intrusion systems in our uh, two of our schools, and in the fall, uh, at the end of October, all of the schools will have intrusion detection systems which that means during the day we can, we can tell if a door is propped open uh, to notify maybe a central office person or um, Phil or one of the principals so they can go down and check the door. Uh, so before that, we didn't really have that insight during the day. It was mostly alarms that were on at night, but we weren't sure what was going on during the day with those doors. So now we have much more insight to the doors uh, during the day. Uh, we've done a lot with professional development over the last five years. Um, you know, through our budget process, we've planned for um, a certain amount of money each year that really allows teachers to be trained in a lot of the new tools that we've brought on. Um, you know, when I first started, for example, we had no Google certified people. Uh, from, I think, last week's count, we had over 40 teachers that are certified Google instructors. So whether they're certified trainers or they have their level one or level two certification. So, we kind of took some of the tools we were using and, and started to build up the expertise with staff, our technical staff, but also with the teachers. Um, managed Wi-Fi throughout the district. Um, and, and seven years ago, we didn't have a full-time network admin, and now we do. So we have someone constantly monitoring the network, make sure the district is safe, um, and dealing with any issues that arise um, over time. This year, we started um, Lisa Cardi is in a new position. She is our our new data analyst, so she's helping Linda Henderson. Um, she's based out of the high school, so we brought that position on, uh, and that's been really helpful, especially this time of year when there's a lot of accounts that have to be set up, um, or if a teacher is simply saying, I need this set of data, um, she can kind of put that together for that teacher and deliver it to them, uh, which has been really, really helpful. Just to kind of go over the, the last year's goals, as far as where we've come last year, our, our goal was to, uh, to really move away from IPASS uh, to our new student information system, which is PowerSchool. Um, that's uh, started, the, the process started about two years ago when we kind of went through the steps of looking for a vendor and a provider. Uh, and it's still ongoing, but uh, we implemented uh, last year, starting in the fall, um, and all schools, um, district rider now uh, utilizing PowerSchool as the main student information system. Um, we also moved away from our older communication system. We used to use a system called iAutoAlert, which uh, wasn't very reliable, uh, to a new system called School Messenger, which has allowed, uh, allowed us to communicate with uh, the district in, in a much easier format and is much more reliable. Uh, last year was also the first year um, that we began testing our computer-based testing uh, for MCAS, uh, and we did that grades four through eight um, quite successfully uh, without a lot of time and effort and training, but really pulled it off, and I think uh, we'll grow from, from there. 
Uh, so that was kind of where we're coming from as far as goals last year. Goals for this year, um, the, the big kind of first lens is operation and management. Um, we're still, we're working to customize PowerSchool. I'll talk about some of the details in a second about that. Uh, but really looking, working out the kinks and customizing the, the system to, to meet our needs. Um, we're going to look to update some technology policies. As I think we have data retention on the books coming up uh, this year with the school committee um, to make sure we're meeting the needs uh, of our community. Uh, we're also doing some work for accessibility and ADA requirements for our website. So we're working on our website to make sure uh, we're up to par. Uh, then the marathon schools is exciting. It's it's amazing to see the progress as you drive by and look how quickly that building's come up. So we're pretty excited. We're actually starting to look at um, technology for that building. Uh, they've started to pull cables. It sounds like for some of the core systems. So that's pretty exciting. Uh, so we'll be working on getting that uh, building outfitted and integrated uh, with the rest of the schools. So that's going to be a big project for us uh, this year. As far as a student learning goal. Uh, we've done a lot of work uh, with curriculum warehousing, and so we've moved away from Atlas um, technology. I, I can't sit up here and say we're much better with technology as the screen constantly goes off and on, but we'll work on that. Um, we've moved away from Atlas, which is a web-based uh, curriculum warehousing tool that we had, um, and we moved it locally, uh, A, to save money and to, to get it closer to where teachers were going to be using it on a more regular basis. So we've created a website um, with uh, Google Sites, uh, and it's much easier for teachers to begin to start to share what they've used and to extract what other teachers have used uh, using Google. So that's an ongoing process that we're going to work on this year and into next year uh, as we update that system. Um, as far as my team and looking at uh, new uh, technology standards that are out by the state, we're going to be looking at doing an inventory this year where we're trying to map out where certain standards are being taught, what grade levels they're being taught at, uh, and try to find if there's any gaps, and then work next year to kind of redesign the curriculum to make sure that we're meeting all the state standards when it comes to the new technology standards. Um, we're working with Hopkins to pilot a new digital grade book um, in PowerSchool, which is pretty exciting. So we have some teachers that are trying the grade book now. Um, and then we're going to share out some of the, the results of that with the other teachers later this year. Uh, and then my professional learning goal is obviously to just to work to continue to advance and eventually be assistant superintendent or some other superintendent at some point in time. So I'm working on that professionally uh, on my own time to, to prepare uh, for other jobs and opportunities. But not saying I'm leaving here. I'm perfectly happy with what I'm doing. Uh, but that's just something I've been working on uh, professionally. The PowerSchool update, um, currently we're in the process, and many of you probably have seen, and uh, we're, we're trying a new online registration process this year. So we're in the, in the end stages of collecting basically all of the re-enrollments of existing students. So we have a little under 3,600 students in the district, uh, and we've collected most applications already. So we're, we have a little less than 300 applications now that we're really trying to collect. And what this is is really just biographical uh, update information. Um, it's uh, parent permission information, photo restrictions, uh, student handbook sign-offs. So we've kind of taken a paper process uh, at each building and put it uh, online. Uh, so we're obviously we're, we'll collect feedback and, and we'll look to improve that as we can. It's just the first year we're rolling it out, so there'll be some changes over time. Uh, so that's kind of underway currently. Um, we just brought on uh, the new uh, SPED module in PowerSchool this fall. So we're going to continue to train uh, teachers and liaisons in the schools to leverage that system. Um, and then later on um, in October, we're going to bring on an ELL module, which is really going to align some of the current um, state requirements that we have uh, in paper format into the PowerSchool database which will make it much easier for teachers to work with those forms and, and to share the data as needed. So that will come on in October. But once those things are rolled out, uh, the last bit that we're going to work on is an analytics package um, that really is going to take uh, some of the student data that we're collecting uh, and put it together in the database to allow students and teachers to kind of make instructional decisions. 
Uh, so right now, uh, historically, we've had some of that data in different uh, areas, and it's really hard for teachers to kind of combine that data and quickly make an instructional decision. So the goal behind this analytics package is to put it in one spot in front of teachers where they can quickly have information that can drive instruction um, as they move forward. So that will come on later in October, uh, or sorry, November uh, this year. School communications, um, this has been uh, something we've really been working on over the last couple of years. I think our, our sh shift strategically, I think, from the old system was that we had a sign-up process where parents were basically signing up for listservs. And what we heard from parents and from even some members of the school committee was that it was confusing, there was too much work, there was too much effort, uh, parents weren't getting a uh, place on the correct lists. So with our new system, once parents go through that uh, re-enrollment process and their email and phone information is, is captured in PowerSchool, it automatically pushes them based on the, the students they have at the grade levels they're at. It automatically pushes those emails to those listservs for those parents. Um, then the parents have the ability to kind of go in and say, okay, I don't want to be on this listserv and unsubscribe from it. So we've kind of done that process over the last couple months. Um, and so parents really, if you're ever asked, like, do I need to sign up for listservs, the answer really is no. They just have to make sure that they have the correct data uh, with us in PowerSchool and we'll do the rest. And that's what this re-enrollment process is, is uh, going on right now and that will help us do. So I think at this point we're going to have more really, really strong, accurate uh, information for parents and it's going to make communication much easier. Um, on top of that, parents can go into to School Messenger and kind of update those bits of information throughout the year as needed. Um, and then later this year, uh, once the re-enrollment process is done, we're going to keep an annual update form in PowerSchool. So if a parent moves, they can just go log into PowerSchool, type in a phone number, or if they have a new email address, they can go and do that, and it will automatically update into our system when we pull it in. So that's kind of what we're working on um, later this year. Great. Uh, we, we created a new SML position. Um, this is really uh, similar to what we call some of our department heads. Uh, for tech integration teachers. So tech integration teachers are on a teaching um, certification, have teaching certifications or under the teacher's contract. Uh, we currently have four tech integrators working in the district. One of those tech integrators is now uh, an SML or just a department head of the other tech integration teachers. So um, Crystal Ho is the, is the teacher that is in charge of that department now. Um, it helps me manage those teachers and kind of run with a lot of the, the technology goals that we have and some of the strategic plans that we're trying to put in place. Um, so she's working with those teachers. She's working with principals. She's working with the central office to help improve uh, professional development, but also to coach uh, the tech integrators, but also to help teach teachers as well. So that's uh, a new position that has started this year. Device goals. So this kind of comes up as a hot topic from year to year, so I thought I'd update you as far as where we are currently. Um, so just to kind of explain this chart, um, ratio, so we've got schools and then we have student device columns. So currently, like I said, at the high school, we're a one-to-one -one ratio. Um, we have roughly 1,200 students uh, in that building. Uh, and it's a uh, choice model, meaning there's three ways to participate. Uh, so there's a lease to own program, there's a BYOD component, or there's a loan pool f uh, from the school where a student can come and loan a device. So that's currently in place at the high schools and been in place now for over five years. I want to say I have to check my math there, but it's, it seems crazy fast. <laughs> um, at the middle school, we have a one-to-one -one program um, with Chromebooks, uh, and that is a model where the devices go home with students. Hopkins is a one-to-one -one environment with Chromebooks as well, but that's a cart-based model, meaning the devices stay in the classroom. Um, and that became one-to-one -one this year when we added an additional uh, set of carts. At the Elmwood School and Center School, it's uh, a center's model where there are iPads, and those are roughly six to seven iPads per classroom currently um, at those two buildings. In addition to some of the, the iPads in the classrooms, there are a couple carts at each of the buildings that teachers have access to. Um, our goal for projectors is to maintain non-interactive projectors uh, at the secondary level and to maintain interactive projectors um, at the elementary level. 
Uh, so we've worked on replacement cycles for those, and we've been, we're in pretty good shape with projectors now throughout the district. Devices uh, refers to the teacher device in that column, which means uh, the teacher laptop. So those are all on lease cycles. Uh, and it just, the year just tells you kind of a what year of the cycle those are on. So for example, high school uh, teachers just got new devices this fall. So they all have new laptops now. Uh, then, for example, the middle school is in year three this year. Uh, then they'll do another fourth year where the lease is paid off, and then they'll start another uh, new lease the following year. So we're really on four-year cycles for teacher devices at the moment. Professional development obviously is a big part. It's one thing to just hand somebody a device and expect them to use it. Professional development is, is a huge part of technology in our district. So we offer lots of different opportunities uh, for teachers. Uh, every year we try to send a, a group of uh, teachers to MassQ, which is a two-day event uh, hosted down in Foxboro, um, where you've got people coming from all over the country, vendors, teachers, students get together and talk about uh, tech. Uh, Google Summit, uh, we started uh, last year hosting our own Google Summit, which was pretty exciting. So we hosted one in December uh, with a company called EdTech Team. Um, they're a certified Google partner and they provide professional development throughout the, the country and the world, really. Um, and so we will be hosting another Google Summit this spring in March here at the high school and we'll hopefully send out more information. Uh, we'd love to see you and maybe invite some school committee members to come. Uh, we're trying to create a component for parents uh, this, this year and some clerical staff. Uh, and so it, we want it to be more of a community event than just uh, simply focusing on, on teachers because we have obviously so much technology in the district, it's important that also the parents in the community kind of understands how that um, equipment works in the school. Uh, so we're looking at a strand for parents coming up in the spring. PD days, obviously we work and tech integrators are a big part of helping principals facilitate some of the training that goes on throughout the year. Um, the, sorry. Um, Faculty meetings, uh, we offer, and when we get time, we'll, we'll come in, I'll come and run a session, or some of the tech integrators will come and run sessions for them. Uh, and then tech integration staff, we try to work individually with teachers in their classrooms, so they act as coaches. So the tech integration staff will go out to the classrooms, they'll work with teachers and say, hey, what kind of lessons are you trying to, to run? How can I help you? And they'll go out and assist them uh, at the classroom level. I'm running probably out of time. So capital projects. I've kind of touched on these. Uh, FY18, the big ones that we were working on, we updated the uh, Wi-Fi at Elmwood in the middle school. So those, those two schools have new wireless access points uh, in the classroom. Um, and then the other big project that will be done at the end of October is the intrusion alarms at the middle school in Hopkins. So those are the last two buildings that will have uh, those systems in place. Uh, planning and looking for some capital items over the next, you know, year or two we'll be working with central office and the principals to kind of prioritize what those will be um, but a component would be to finish off some of the uh, security planning that we had done um, and started uh, which would be looking at some cameras uh, at some of the buildings and the external parts of the buildings um, we would be looking at upgrading some of the sound equipment in the auditorium and then looking at our closet infrastructure, which is really all the switches and the core components that connect all the buildings and classrooms to see um, what needs to be replaced. Some of that, those pieces of equipment are, are reaching into life, so we're going to look at replacing those over the next couple of years. <laughs> that, I think, is it. So if you feel like this one day, give us a call. Um, and we'll, we'd be happy to help. We'd be happy to answer questions. I know it's a lot in a short period of time, but... Be happy to answer questions uh, on any of those topics or concerns or things that have come up from community members. I, I had a couple things I was jotting down sure. as you were going along. First, I think it's great the forms have moved onto an online rather than getting all those stack of papers, papers at the beginning yeah. of the year. Are those, and maybe they already are, and I just didn't understand, but are they able to be done through the app as well, or is it that? That particular the um, component has to be done through a web browser. So okay. you could technically do it on a mobile device yep. through the URL, but it's a lot of typing. But the app itself won't work or connect you okay. to Okay, so there are differences in what that, that's I, just what I'm trying to understand. And if I could quick, like, I could quickly highlight those two. The, the only two real differences are you can't do the online registration on the app. You can't see a uh, printed report card format on the mobile app. Those are the two major differences. 
uh, between the two. Okay, that's great. In the digital grade book at Hopkins, is that similar to what they're doing at the middle and high school already, or is that a separate? Correct. It would be the same, the same uh, digital grade book that they use. Um, teachers, it's not to say that teachers aren't using digital grade books now. They're just but not using a standardized right. uh, grade book uh, like the secondary level is. So all the secondary teachers are using the grade book that comes with PowerSchool. It's nice and to look at the full spectrum of all of the things that you've been working on um, over the past couple of years. It is an impressive list. Yeah, it keeps us busy. I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was fun looking back with to where you were five years ago. Yeah, it is nice to do because we don't always get a chance to do it. So thank you. Yeah, I do think that was very, very informative just to understand what was entailed in the work that you undertake. And I'm sure there's tons of details underneath. And I'm just wondering, you know, to accomplish all of this, uh, how big is your team and how has that grown over five years? It's just me. <laughs> <laughs> He's got a, yeah. a cape that he wears on his back. It's um, super he had a lot of caffeine. Yeah, yeah. I, I didn't explain the growth of the team very well over the last couple of years. But um, when I first started in this role, um, we probably had about um, three tech integration teachers. We had Linda, our data person. Um, I had a support uh, secretary position. And I think that was kind of the, the core. Um, we've added a tech integration. So we have four tech integration teachers. We've added a few technicians. So we've got the technical people doing all the repairs. Uh, so we now have, I want to say, four technicians, five technicians. So I think we're around 15 people. So I think we've gone around, from around five to about 15. Uh, people in about seven years. Um, this is so, a lot of work, and to support all of that, you do need a strong team. Yes, it's um, it's definitely a fair amount of work. I mean, when you think about the number of devices alone that we're supporting, it's you know close to five thousand devices when you think about it. Um, so, it's it's for that when you look at that, and then you know start to think about the parent support. You know, when we roll out things like online registration. I get home, I'm calling parents, and <laughs> I can't get logged in. And so everyone's pitching in at this time of year to make that happen. But, but it's a good team, and uh, I think uh, we're, we're managing pretty well. And what about the uh, website support? How do you interact with others in terms of the content management on the website? So the, the, the whole goal, I think, strategy with our content management system was to give individual departments control over that. So we moved to... The web system called School Wires is what the, the company that managed it, and it's now bought by Blackboard. But we moved to that system so we could give the people in those departments the ability to edit their own sections. And so for the most part, that is our strategy. Then the tech integration uh, teachers do a little bit to update the individual pages uh, at their buildings. And some of the support staff at those buildings also contribute to editing those. But we don't really have a true person that's constantly editing and updating the website. So that that's something we're managing with now and trying to make better. It's, it's when we have time, we do some updates. So it's it's not always as up to date as we'd like to see it, but we're working on it. Well, this is great and very exciting. I know my son is very excited with, uh, you know, the interactive boards and all the technology that they have in school, which he doesn't always get at home. Mm. <laughs> Balance is good. Yes, thank you. For we'll support that. <laughs> um, so th thank you for this. I, first and foremost, I just want to say I, I like that you put that um, mission statement up at the beginning yeah. because I think that's important to remember, and I, I know yeah. you always keep it in mind, that we one of the things that I think we hear the sort of, you know, on the soccer sideline comment is, that's negative about technology is sort of is it replacing education and I know that's always been a big philosophy that you've executed on which is that it's meant to enhance it where appropriate and and the integration piece of it has been really great to see um, even to the point of like I know from from my own experience with my son the the one-to-one -one at Hopkins on the cart model they don't use them that much right they use them when when it's appropriate and so that's I think that's something that that people um, probably don't realize enough um, but th how much work goes into that balance. So that's, that's appreciated. Um, and, and I also want to thank you. The, I, I don't have any specific questions, but I really like the layout of your device slide mm. um, because I know in, you'll be back in a month or two and we'll be talking about budget. So having that consolidated is just really helpful to kind of understand where we are and what might be some of the drivers of 
of device purchases either this year or next. So I thought that was a really nice addition. Thank you. Jean, before we move on and while we're sticking with, with John's comment, um, it would be a great time for you to jump in right now, Ashok. To, to the comment about how they're used, particularly you called out the Hopkins School mm -hmm. and the integration and, and the balance between using technology, um, I think it would be great to, to just bring the, the school committee up to date on the assessment piece um, in terms of not only state level but just how we're using assessments um, within the district and how that's changed over the past few years. Sure. Yeah, I mean, I think to, to your point, too, is that, I mean, the big piece is really with, with the equipment is flexibility, right? And so how can we provide that equipment for teachers so that it doesn't become such a organizational problem that they don't use it, right? So that they have to plan with teacher down the hall and schedule it and they just never bother because it's too much time. So so we kind of plan to have enough devices to kind of manage that situation and meet those those needs. Um, so the, the big, you know, not to say that it's the only driver because we, we move forward with putting in one-to-one -one environments and more technology to support curriculum and not to support necessarily high stakes testing. But we can't, we can't ignore the fact that that is a component of one of the main reasons or a reason, I won't say even main because it's not the main reason, that we have uh, the number of devices that we have. So as a district, we were able to successfully navigate grades four through eight in a computer based model because we adequately planned and prepped for that transition. Whereas many districts were trying to successfully do it with one grade. Uh, so we did a lot of planning and that paid off in that area. Um, on top of that, we've done some work with um, a new benchmark tool um, called Star Math. So where we're benchmarking some of these kids in math, you know, at least trying to get in three benchmark assessments a year. Uh, so to be able to do that quickly without disrupting the environment, it's important to have that device quickly uh, where teachers can pull it out, test them over you know, 20 minutes, then go back to uh, instruction. And so that's been really powerful in the last, just the last year, um, where then teachers quickly get that information, are able to look at it, bring it to a PLC meeting, make some instructional decisions, um, and inform instruction. So that's been, that's been wonderful. Uh, and so having those, those device ratios um, has been helpful. So as far as driving the budget discussion, yes, I think there will be some discussion about um, looking at Elmwood School and, and figuring out if there's enough devices at least in grade three. Because uh, I think we're looking at making a decision not to test, you know, in grade three digitally this year, but maybe the following year looking at computer-based testing. And that's something the state's wanting us to do, but we're not going to be doing that uh, this year based on availability of equipment. So that's something we're going to look at and talk about during budget time. Thank you. Yep. So I, I just have one quick question. I, I, um, and I've been here since sort of the advent of all of this. And I, I think that, um, you know, it was very daunting when we first started talking about it. I mean, maybe not the advent, but early, early on. And um, I just am really struck listening to you about how thoughtful the approach has been to sort of adding gradually and being strategic about how you did that, not, in term, not only in terms of making it more manageable for a budget, you know, from a budget standpoint, but also from the professional development standpoint and the teacher standpoint and not just, you know, like you said, there's, a, there's another thing on a pile on your desk that you got to take care of, but giving people the opportunity to get up to speed and, and all the training. I think, so I think it's been, um, added in in a very rich way, um, which I think it has been really remarkable. So thank you for your leadership in that regard. Um, and I'm sitting here thinking, well, what will, what will the next several years um, bring? And I'm just struck by all the conversations we've had about the um, rapidly increasing diversity in the community and wondering how are parents managing, you know, f for whom English isn't their s first language, how are they filling out the power school um, biographical data how are they I, I, are you having to also assist with that process yes I mean and we we've had uh, ongoing conversations I'm guessing that <laughs> from, from the reaction <laughs> yeah so but. we've had we've had ongoing conversations about this and and we just finished up a pretty productive meeting last week with principals kind of outlining some strategies to address that issue and so um, in terms of technology technology will help and we're going to see some things come out even with school messenger so as an example We'll still have to do the translation. Let's say we want to push out a, a normal a district level broadcast or a message. 
we could take that, we just have to take that message and translate it into the, the required language and we can then kind of paste it into school messenger and the message will go out and then parents will be able to choose. So uh, if a parent can choose their language preference, mm -hmm. then that parent, let's say they want to receive it in Spanish, that parent will only get the Spanish message. So that's the, the use that we're looking at right now for technology, at least for d delivering messages. Mm -hmm. But the technology in that particular example is not good enough to completely translate the message for us. Google Translate will do a lot of that for us and will cover the basic um, needs for, um, you know, hey, there's a you know fundraiser coming at this day. But for an IEP, that's not going to necessarily work. So based on what the need is, we might need translation services or we might use Google Translate. So technology will help some, and we've talked to principals about pushing and communicating to those uh, various languages, um, but we're also looking at translating some of the online forms and making those available um, to those parents, which is currently underway. That's great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to thank him. Um, yeah. I just also wanted to say, as I'm listening to your presentation, Ashok, and listening to the school committee members, what struck me was that the work that you do touches all of us. Mm -hmm. Like it, every, nobody can go through their day without being impacted by the work that you do. And you do it in a way that's very patient and supportive and planful um, so that the people that you work with also don't feel overwhelmed. So I want to thank you for your leadership, for your patience, for the wonderful team that you had. And I think, you know, you didn't have a chance to call out the fact that not only around professional development are they going to these w opportunities, but in many cases they're leading them. And we're awfully proud of all of the people, not only um, within your team, but also teachers within our district mm. who you've inspired to want to be presenting what they've learned about technology to other teachers. And I don't know how many we have going to the summit or to the MassQ this the MassQ, year. MassQ, we probably will have about 19 people going. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's three fantastic. Of them, four of them, we usually have three or four people presenting yep. at that conference a year, which is great. It's awesome. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you thank so you. much. Thank you. Thank you. That's a great presentation. Does anyone else need a projector tonight or should I turn uh, that off? No, we're good. I think we're good. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So why don't we go back up to liaison reports and start at the top with communications. Presentation with you. Thank you, Dr. McLeod, for bringing this in. I just imagined that it would magically appear um, on the project. Next time it will. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, you may recall a few months ago, we, uh, you know, when the new school committee members, me and Jen, we had joined, we had talked about possibly looking at community communications, and I was put in charge. And over the summer, Dr. McLeod and I, we chatted a little bit, exchanged some ideas on why and, uh, you know, what is the need for this, and what do we really want to do. So just some back and forth on this. And some of it was actually coming from, um, you know, some of the things I had heard, either directly or through some of the friends, which you can see on the slide. Uh, for instance, uh, one of the parents talked to me about the fact that the foreign language program should start early. And I shared this with Dr. McLeod, and Dr. McLeod said, oh, but a couple of years ago, we went through this whole process, and there was a reason why we chose not to go forward with it. And so we realized that, you know, there is this information available, but clearly not accessible to a parent in the community. Um, and I shared something that I heard from one of the seniors, the senior se center saying, please, no more new school buildings. But then we also know the growth in the community that's happening and the state of you know, some of our buildings and some of the facilities. So how do we bridge that gap? How do we talk to one another so that we can understand each other better? And I guess uh, for me, just looking at our community with all that is available in the community in terms of the richness of the experiences that people have. And one of my hopes was, how can we bring all of this together better? How can we lean on one another better? How can we learn from one another better? How can we understand one another better? And so um, moving on to the next slide, this is um, something Dr. McLeod has talked about, viewing problems as opportunities. Perfect. And we are certainly a well-intentioned, you know, we have uh, lots of volunteers in the community, great team in the school. 
and you know in the town in general and we felt like we have such well-intentioned community members working so hard and uh, working so hard to make the community and schools better and there are several efforts which are successful right yet sometimes we're not fully utilizing the resources and sometimes we are also in our little silos so we saw that as an opportunity that let's figure out a way let's acknowledge our issues and figure out a way to work better this is still in a very early stage and i don't think it's a novel idea as such uh, but at the same time we felt this is something we do need to look at as a community before the gaps or the silos widen, right? Um, so how can we make sure as the community is growing, how to bring folks who are new to the town, for instance, into the fold and try to understand some of the pains of folks who have been living in the town for a long time. For instance, one of the seniors was talking about the fact that getting out of Chamberlain Street is very painful with all the um, you know, traffic, and as folks age, we know that some of the reflexes are not as sharp. So how can we help? Is there, a, you know, just an understanding? I think that will go a long way. And when I was talking to Dr. McLeod, my focus was a lot on the school, like what can we do from a school perspective, and Dr. McLeod stopped me, and she said it's not just all about schools. There's some work that parents need to do. Right, and we share that responsibility. So um, you'll see in the next couple of slides some of the things we talked about. So in terms of, you know, what is it that we are looking for? This is a hope in terms of learning, creating, achieving together, focusing on achieving together. That if only we come together, you know, the sky is the limit. We can achieve whatever we want. And from a student perspective, with our community, we have small businesses, we have artists, we have professionals, we have entrepreneurs. How can we get our children to, you know, be more aware, engage, empathize, contribute to the community? And I think um, Jean had talked about this earlier uh, in our conversations. Seniors love it when they see some of our students giving back, or more and more of our students giving back to the community. And the kids, um, the student council members, talking about 100 of them volunteering. So these are some of the ideas. I mean, it's still very broad, um, you know, what, what all we're talking about in terms of coverage. And we'll be bringing it down. At this point in time, it's a lot of brainstorming. So like I was talking about earlier, if you move on to the next slide, um, and to my earlier point, how Dr. McLeod was talking about you know, the home, the parents play a crucial role. We drew out a triangle of influence for our children. On one end, we have the home, the school, and the community. If we can work on all these three, you know, what more can we want for our children? That's the greatest, you know, those are the three great influences to make them better. And we're very fortunate in Hopkinton that individually all these areas are very strong. Uh, we just want to find that mode to make it uh, collaborate better and listen to one another better. So moving on to the next slide. And, you know, again, a lot of this is under discussion with a uh, wider group of people. We have talked about how, you know, if you look at on the parent, on the home front of the family, uh, on, the, um, on the influence triangle, we have the HPTA, we have the CPAC. They're working and speaking on behalf of the parents, right? Those are the voices, and they interact with the school. And in, in terms of the school, we have the superintendent's office, the teachers, the schools, they are all communicating. And on the community front, you know, we have, for instance, the Youth Commission, we have the Diversity Alliance, we have the Board of Selectmen, the Fire Department, Police Department, the Library. And I guess from the school perspective, there is that interaction happening with all of these uh, community organizations. And so we want to create a forum to kind of sit down and talk a little bit, what is working, what all is in place, how can it be better, how can we make sure that we are complementing each other's work rather than replicating it? Obviously, there is a lot of overlap in terms of the work, uh, but that's where the thought process is. So what we did is we worked, um, you know, we called out some of the folks that Dr. McLeod had already been working with. For instance, the HPTA, the Youth Commission, um, the Diversity Alliance, 
and uh, the CPAC. So we all got together, and um, and uh, Denise Hildreth, who is um, also heading um, the Youth and Family Services. So we all got together and we chatted for a little bit. What are some of the issues that we have? Uh, that we face in the community. There was uh, a lot of conversation around discrimination that folks feel. Um, we also talked about egos. We mm -hmm. talked about a bunch of things. And so at the same time, they were, we were also talking about solutions. So we have started a brainstorming um, sheet that, that is open to a bunch of folks. And we have also um, talked about the possible participants that we want in this communication group. And um, what we are hoping to do is get together and come up with a charter first. Like I said, there's a lot that we're talking about here. We want to define our charter and lay out our next steps. Um, and also, there is some work that Dr. McLeod had already put together, worked on with the Diversity Alliance as well as the Youth Commission. And so uh, there is a plan to invite uh, one of the specialists on, on communications from the Visions, um, there's a company with mm -hmm. that name, and I'm sure Dr. McLeod can give more details. So we've started some work there to who will come and talk to us a little bit about communications. Mm -hmm. Again, like I said, this is very early, um, but any feedback that you have so far in terms of uh, you know, who else we could involve, any thoughts, they're very welcome. Dr. McLeod, did you I just I just wanted to thank you, Mina, because, um, you know, obviously for these, these wonderful detailed charts and, and color-coded, um, taking the concepts that we have discussed and then putting them into a visual mm -hmm. has been really helpful yeah. to, for the committee. And I think when we're talking about these kinds of issues, it's, it's hard to depict it. And it's been really helpful in helping us organize our thoughts. Um, our representative from the Visions organization was recommended actually to us f from a number of resources that Tamaria had shared where the committee got to a place where they felt that, okay, now we want, we want some actions, we want some strategies, we want some tools. Um, and this individual is coming to meet with our group next Friday uh, and his role is really to help us to take those next steps, help us to identify what are the challenges within our committee. And this is why we, we chose Visions over other organizations, of which there are many, because it's, it's not cookie, not that I'm suggesting that everybody's our cookie cutter, but, but they really make a point of, of really fashioning their work around the specific needs. So his first job is to find out what those are, um, and then to help us prioritize and, and think about what could be the first steps um, because the, the, I guess, the, the desire is to want to do everything all at once. And so certainly it's there. It's been wonderful working with such a wide group of people um, who have common um, concerns for the community. Um, and, of course, my interest at this point that I, I said to Mina, it's really great that there's other people to hold me back because my interest, I just, I want action. I want to be able to move forward. I want to be able to do something. Um, and understanding that first we need, we need to have a plan. We need to, and we've done, I believe, a lot of work developing trust. Um, and now we're ready for the next step and, and reaching out to some outside leadership from somebody who has expertise in this work is something we realized that we needed to do. So. Can I ask you a question? So. Um, this is, I, I mean, there's a, a ton of, of, of great analysis, and I agree with the, the visuals and, and data collection here. Um, so it, what's the vision for the output of this? And the reason I ask that is just because I, on, on, the, on the one hand, it sounded like we were talking about a sort of a structure and plan for communication and information dissemination, but then there was a discussion around issues facing the community that people are feeling like discrimination and those both feel really really large but yeah. also divergent yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah and that's i so I, I didn't know what the thought was there so um i can take that okay. on and like i said you know it is clearly a very wide topic right and mm -hmm. in terms of distilling we're, we're still very early we do mm -hmm. want to call out a charter but uh, by identifying the issues, we hope to 
nail down our plan and chart a better. So that's the reason why we're letting everyone speak their mind first. What is it that they're feeling in their heart? If they're feeling this is a problem in the school, there's a lot of work that's being done at the school. Dr. McLeod, as I understand, has already laid out a lot of programs within mm -hmm. each of the schools. And so how do folks know that all of this work is already being done? Right. right and so maybe there's a gap there of communication and sometimes maybe we're not hearing something well enough sometimes you're so caught up in your own work you think it's all working well but there's someone out there who is feeling a little left out or you know unheard so we're trying to at this point in time just keep it all open just listen to everybody and you know there are uh, folks who have you know just general issues about not being heard and they're bringing it up and we're just listening at this point in time. Okay. No, that's that that what you said about the the programs and the sort of awareness that that was helpful. So okay, thank you. It's great feedback, John. It's the, it's the exact thing that Amina and I were discussing when we were looking at all of this. Was that this this um, slide here, the one with all of the little circles on it? That I said, why is the superintendent circle so big? It shouldn't be so big. <laughs> it should be the same size as all the other circles. And she said, it's because of the size of the word, Kathy. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> now that makes sense to me. Thank you for bringing that up. Line but, break. Although, yeah. yeah. But um, I think that this is a really good visual for us to think about when we when we address the question that you raised, John, because you can see within these circles where that the answer to that question lies. Right. Amongst all of the circles and all of the organizations and all of the communications within the community, um, one piece of it is addressing the concerns that, that I'm laying out around around um, diversity and and those the conversations the respectful conversations and working with an outside agency to help us to address challenges that we might have as being one form of communication that we want to look at within the 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 scope of the committee and, yeah. and I also think that you know some of the things that you will see upcoming is besides the problems and solutions is ownership right not everything is owned necessarily you know the responsibility doesn't always fall with the schools sometimes it's with the parents you know they also have a responsibility to reach out to the school to understand things better i'd like to see for instance more folks come into the school committee meetings um, maybe five hours of uh, you know commitment to the volunteering at school from the parents something like that would be you know just as a basic expectation. And what is it that they would like to see as an expectation from a school? We'd like to hear that. So all of these conversations, again, still very early, mm -hmm. uh, but that's the path we are taking. I, two comments I wanted to make. Um, one is I love uh, what you said about complementing each other's work rather than replicating. I think that's a really big issue in our community at large. And I also think that this visual for yes, people who have that. smaller middle school age and maybe younger this you do yeah, this exactly. reminds me very much of a fidget spinner and I'm not saying oh, that to disrespect yeah, but, no, I, but because crazy. I think the balance when you hold a fidget spinner I'll hold it up for you guys I'm sure have seen fidget now spinners. I get it yep. if you hold the balance that it takes for them all to go around and keep going and I think that's very much true in this is that it's a balance between all three of those so wow. it, it was a good visual for me so we're on trend too yeah. <laughs> I, I, we are on trend. Thank you for that. Thank that, you. Was, that was so uh, comprehensive, and um, and I've been hearing little pieces of it, and so it was really helpful to sort of hear how it's all coming together. And I think that, you know, you can't really solve an issue until you know what the issue is, and you need to make sure everybody has a common understanding of that. And so it feels to me like this is the part that you're really coming to the end of, that you've invested a lot of time and pulled a lot of people and voices into the room, which I think is fantastic. And I just, um, I mean, I really look forward to seeing where this is going to go. I think it's so important. Um, and I really credit both of you for doing this. I don't, people are so busy in their lives and taking, just stopping and taking the time to really focus on this and open up and listen and talk to each other is just, it's a great place to start. And so I know that you're the right ambassador for this, <laughs> and, uh, and, and we will make forward progress. So thank you both, and I, I look forward to hearing the next steps when they arrive. Thank you for your trust. I just want to say that we share equal responsibility, and I want to mention Dr. Denise Hildreth and Timoria Saba. 
and Jenrod from HBTA and uh, Jennifer uh, Christine. I'm sorry, Ch I forget. Christine Chapman. Chapman, Chapman Christine Chapman, um, Marla Marasco, and there are a few others too. And I'm just missing. You've got some name. great people to yes. to collaborate yes, that's with. Right. That's right. You know, strength. we we take these compliments and share them with them. And of course, Dr. McLeod, I mean, I can't thank her enough how open she has been to all of this. With all the hard work that you do, and you know, being outside the committee as a parent, you don't understand what it takes to run a school. And you get a little glimpse of it once you're on the school committee. And with all of that, to have your openness, to consider all of this, to listen to all the feedback, and sometimes you're thinking, we have done all of this. And to still hold your tongue, that takes something. So it's I'm much never appreciated. never thinking that. OK, thank you, Mina. <laughs> Some more to come. All this right. is just the beginning. Very exciting. Um, all right, well, so that's big shoes to fill. Jen, are we ready to talk oh, about we're moving to great we're moving to me now yeah. <laughs> there's no pressure but do you have yeah. a, a fidget spinner of any kind I, I have no props a flute okay I, I was gonna say at least you didn't follow the flute and clarinet a check. I, that's true <laughs> yeah but there's an upside that is it right there um so my liaison report is related to the center school reuse um, advisory team, which is affectionately referred to now as the CRATS. Yes, C R A T is the ac acronym. Isn't that awesome? Mm -hmm. um, so, Center School Reuse Advisory Team. Thank you. You got it. I know okay. I saw your face. Um, so, the letter was sent out to all town boards and um, committees trying to gather some input um, for what folks have already sort of in their head have um, for center schools repurposing or whatever happens to center school. Um, there are a ton of questions that have been brought up. Even we met last night again, and so a ton of other questions have been brought up. But we thought we'd at least address this, um, these few questions that they sent out in the packet. I don't know if you got a chance to see it, but I'll throw them out there one at a time. If anything comes into your mind, let me know. I'll type it in here and share it with the, um, the okay. committee. It, does that sound reasonable? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. So yeah, just to recap for people that are like, for because of the open meeting law, we can't all just send our comments. So right. We'll be group editing this document, um, and you'll you're our note taker. Oh, I will and be our note taker. So that's great. Okay. Uh, so the first question is, um, are we familiar with the center school building? So I think we can take care of that. Yes. Um, but specifically, the second one says, does your department board or committee, committee have any needs that could involve the use of the center school building and or the grounds? Um, so after Marathon School opens, do we foresee any need that center school may fill? Would we be interested in the, in the office space, perhaps, to move the central yeah. office down that way? central office space. So, uh, Something that had been so I think we could definitely put that in there as a as a could it's something that I've yeah. I've been thinking about because that's been sort of since we started on yes. this center school endeavor that's been a thought but what keeps rattling around in my head is we just moved one of the last schools that wasn't in that Hayden Row area to that Hayden Row area are we really going to then move central office out of that we Hayden Row a, area but in terms of the cost savings well and that's the I think there be yeah a, I, I, right, it analysis analysis right it would and I think that's where it could it would probably be <coughs> worth it I mean if it would be significant savings then we'd have to probably explore it but I just think about it, it yes doesn't. I the ability <laughs> yeah. to walk across the street I'm sure right. for it's, nice. it's wonderful right yeah. the other um, thing that that I think uh, we could make use of that building for is um, a home for our life skills program, our 18 to 22 um, program for for some of our special needs students because it's already got, you know, kitchen, the kitchen and, gymnasium. and a gymnasium and they um, could certainly could, culinary stuff. Exactly. And, and just, you know, I mean, uh, graduating from high school and moving on, it's nice to if they can go to a new location. I think that feels a little bit more um, that they have a little bit more ownership and control over. So I, I would love to see that. I don't know if if you all have had a chance to think about this in terms of your departments and you have other suggestions. I know sometimes we talk about the storage building for some of our equipment. Maybe that's too far removed to John's point from the other um, buildings, but I don't know. So, uh, you know, possibly sharing 
with someone else mm -hmm. in that space? It, it oh, could yes. be, yep. There's plenty of right. room there, and especially with the playground, too, at the back. Right? Mm -hmm. So I, I would also say, I mean, I don't know how much the school uses the center school gym beyond center school gym, right. but yeah. it feels like if we're using the word could, I, I would say right. the gym feels like an asset that the school might at some point have need for use of. Mm -hmm. so. I, I don't know if this falls under, I was trying to be careful when I went through the questions of, okay, which one is related to the school versus the community use or mm -hmm. versus the town mm -hmm. use? So I don't know if this falls under town use or school use, but I also think considering moving the polling location to the gym oh, at the center yes. school and out of mm -hmm. the Brown gym so that we just don't have the conflict oh, okay. with teacher parking, student parking, it's interacting with idea, students. Um, yep. You know, so I don't know which of those. Town. Town, okay. Yep. Although but still, from a school it's one perspective, of our questions. we'd be smiley. If yeah, I it, think we're allowed to answer it anyway, right? right? One of the questions that came up in one of our meetings was whether or not we would want to hold on to center school for a possible staging point for our kids while Elmwood School is being renovated. I don't think it would be able to house the number, because Elmwood has more students, correct? That it, If we're already at capacity... At a K one school, I can't imagine putting the two. It plus size wise, it doesn't seem like things would be appropriate. Right. With the full understanding that I don't have a better answer right now of where to put right. kids if we're renovating Elmwood yeah. School, I, I I'm hard pressed to feel like we could move our pre K or our K one kids out of that school to a brand new school and then put, put the two, two three, three in it for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. I don't, I, I feel like that's not really sending a great message. It, it was determined to be, a, if, if I recall, when we go back to when we were originally talking about the center school, b b I don't know how many years ago when we first talked about prior to the marathon school, that my understanding is that the MSBA had sort of thought that as a school, center school was sort of obsolete. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, I, yes, yes. Was, I and that was my next question to kind of throw out there is, um, are there, res specifically last night the question was raised that are there any restrictions or considerations for the MSBA um, for using center school during Elmwood? And so if that's the case, then there there may be. That, so. w that was the designation. I mean, I think additionally, you would have to put a lot, I, I don't have any of the numbers in front of me, but I just off the top of my head, you would have to spend a great deal of money on center school before you could put more students back there. I mean, for one thing, the heat <laughs> is it, it's not <laughs> going to, go to get list. better right. um, having not been addressed. So we already know that's a critical issue. We have issues with the windows. And the difference in the educational requirements of the second and third graders in terms of technology mm -hmm. and in terms of materials, I don't see the, I don't think the building can support the technology. I mean, I don't know. It's hopefully better now. But when I was in the PTA, if you used the laminator, then the coffee, coffee machine yeah. wouldn't work and whatever, vice versa. Well, the so, yeah, it, it, I mean, I think the fire chief spent as much time there as the students, you know, many times. So um, I just, I, I think it's a great example of thinking creatively about how the building can support needs in the town. But I think that that's like a... That's a money pit situation to try to put yeah. the kids there. I don't know. You probably have, I, I don't want to put MSBA, you on the spot. But. The MSBA call out, I don't know that the MS, like there's a designation problem with it. I just think if we got to that stage of the project and the MSBA said, looked at it and said, you're going to put the kids where? Right. Like, I, mean, we just, I mean, we just are going through this process with them right now. I, I can't imagine that they would advance a project through their process if that was our solution. Well, and the other thing that's dangerous is you have, we have no control over when or if Elmwood is going to be invited into the pipeline. Right. And, you know, yes, my, in my parents' hurt. hometown, there's a former school in the center of town that has literally been empty for 20 years. So you can imagine, and, and it's from start to finish, will take about 17 years to have the marathon school open. So I certainly hope that that's not the path that the town goes down with the Elmwood school. But I just, I don't know, I think it's, um, it's, the bottom line from everything that you're saying, and when I first heard this concept and was thinking staging, John, it took me back to the discussion that we had when they first thought of 
the the possibility or, or the option because we considered all options of building a school adjacent to the current center school and what that would mean and what it comes down to is the edu the impact on the educational program of the children who are in the staging area so even if it's for part of a year even if it's only one grade while they're working on renovating another part of the building as i tried to think of any scenario the educational impact on that group of children would be such that it would never be anything that that i would recommend um, and for all reinforcing all of the reasons that you've al already given on top of that um, you'd have to the bathrooms do not meet the needs even right. the, for one thing but the disruption to their education would be such that it just would not be viable i will pass that on <laughs> and to hold that entire building that parts of which could be repurposed for something else useful in the community to hold it vacant for the possibility would seem like a tremendous amount of money right there yeah. sure and lost opportunity for other groups that could use the building right which was another, I mean, I know I'm getting off track of the, of the questionnaire, but that was another question, you know, when is the, when does it become a school, cease to be a school building and become a town building, and when is that transition, which doesn't have to be answered tonight, but that's things that we're going to have to find the answers to. Do you know, John? I mean, it, 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 I don't know that there is a specific and set date. We just have to, we just have to at some point vote to hand it back over to the yeah, town. Exactly. But I would just basically say when when it closes. I mean, exactly. when the when the last day of school, any time after the last day of school, 2018, right? Yeah, exactly. Okay. This is a thought that just popped into my head, and may let's let's put it under the creative thought category because it may be completely infeasible. If we think about the potential of expanding the parking area back to the field mm -hmm. could that be a bus parking mm -hmm. lot option hmm, hmm. I, I'm going like this because I feel like maybe you mentioned it to me because I feel like somebody just said that I just feel like some, you. somewhere Ralph is proud of me though <laughs> <laughs> He's he in is school. don't you think <laughs> yeah yeah no that is a, that's a great that's a great thing to yeah, add to our putting list it in there okay right in the center of town and they do the buses can get in and sure out of can. there in flow they so they yeah. do it yeah. right yeah they already do it okay that's a great suggestion I, I have a general question are there any plans <laughs> to improve the facility you know it, it's really in a bad condition right, right. well that's the other thing I mean we've only had two meetings so both meetings have been jam-packed with a lot of information and a lot of brainstorming but yes that's trying to figure out um, whether the the renovations and modifications that would be required in order to make the building into offices or shops or whatever it is um, the costs associated with that and and it's in the historic district so the front facade has to be maintained um, mm -hmm. everything else is fair game but just the facade has to stay the same so um, yeah there's there can that's one of the considerations and we don't have we would have to get estimates and things like that well that's going to be largely dependent on what the future what goes state into is it. right yeah. so depending on what we're going to do with it is right. going to determine what the renovation needs are going to be right. i would think that also might depending on what the use is open up some different possibilities for funding sources that some things might be eligible for a grant right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right so all right are we good on number two here yes on, and if you think of anything else we can go back um, so, uh, three talks about um, ideas or suggestions for municip municipal use for the grounds, which um, so the voting, I guess I can move voting, that down there. Um, the bus parking, I think. Bus parking, okay. Yeah. And just generally expanded downtown parking. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. right. Okay. In, in the building, I, I would could foresee some kind of a youth center or rec center or mm -hmm. different community space that could be used by multiple ages of groups okay. yeah, I agree parks and rec is also renting office space so if if they could have their offices there and they could there's the a facility. gym right there yep. um, yeah I think that would be great there was some after-school programming for early release days yes mm -hmm. um, how about community use for the school building I mean parks and rec for sure but are there other things that come to mind I mean I mentioned under the school use but I just keep coming back to the fact of, of keep the gym yeah yeah, yeah. I, I just I mean there's right. a lot of just, people have said that's yeah. a revenue yeah. source that's really part of the school I guess so that to Basketball. that 1980 yeah. edition okay yeah. all right um so uh, what about private use do you have any thoughts 
yes. ideas, suggestions for private use of the facility? A marathon museum. <laughs> Tim yep. would be happy. It's right at the start line. That's right. No, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Can I back up one? Speaking of the marathon, so the um, mobility impaired runners gather in the center school gym before the race and right. so I think that it's important to be able to retain that 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 was brought up yesterday yeah. yep okay. they want to they're very aware of the fact that the marathon uses it and they want to try to maintain that but that also comes I Susan was great thank you for providing all the information about what it would cost cost to sort of keep the open vac the open the vac the building open but vacant for a year or longer um, and so that's the tricky part if it's going to be open and vacant for all but one day out of the year that's hard mm -hmm. so trying to find other temporary uses for it while they figure out what to actually do with it is is sort of important to make the cost worth mm -hmm. right um, Does there have any suggestions or ideas for the use of the center school building or grounds in general? So you've talked about parking. Um, one of the things that's come up to has been trails access back there. Um, there's 22 acres of land, mm -hmm. so it really? goes back quite far. Um, yeah, and so I mean, if you can think of anything else, just under other Gen Six, and I don't know this. This letter is being no, addressed to the committee, right. so I don't know how the committee feels about this, but I'm just going to put it out there for the committee's consideration. I met with the YMCA um, along with the other superintendents in the surrounding areas last week. Um, they had reached out and they're they're looking for a home and they feel that, and, and this won't be news to anybody uh, or news to the Board of Selectmen, I don't think, um, that, that they've done a lot of studies, they've done a lot of uh, forums and they believe that Hopkinton would be the best place. Um, as far as the location and access to neighboring communities, like it was Holliston and Ashland um, that they service, as well as um, Dover, Sherborne, mm -hmm. the, the Sherborne part of Dover, oh, Sherborne. Wow. Um, so it was the three superintendents from Holliston, uh, Ashland, and myself. Um, and they had just asked that, given this type of opportunity, to remind communities um, that they would that they really would love to build a facility in one of the communities um, and they're looking for a place when you say 22 acres right um, so I throw it out there for the committee's consideration sure. um, don't know if, how you feel about it so they're not looking for the actual building that's already there they're looking for space on I the, uh, I think they would not necessarily Nancy I think that you know they're looking for a place to to potentially build maybe renovate um, they want to build a facility, a, re okay. a facility for a recreation facility, after school facility. Their vision would include a pool. Potentially, yeah, so potentially the answer could be both, right? Yeah. yeah. Maybe mm -hmm. they want to renovate that and build. The access to 135, mm -hmm. just, as, just as you're brainstorming right now, and I'm thinking about the meeting I had with them last week, is, is great for access to, peop to folks who live in Ashland. Yep. Um, a before and after school care, a daycare center. They talked about outreach to the seniors and all of the things that they're doing for seniors within the YMCA community. Um, so nice well, that certainly community. adds an opportunity for revenue to the town in mm -hmm. terms of if they can have a portion of that parcel, you know, purchase mm -hmm. a portion of that parcel. Um, Right. Even, it, even if there was a lot of community use, I'm yeah. sorry, in the building, then... Right, because it, it can be divided up. Your, the, the, the committee to... Um, the directors, the YMCA directors, to say that there was a committee that had been established okay. that we're considering, um, but I didn't know if this committee, you know, how they felt about including that in your in your feedback. And this is in addition kids, to the yeah, facility yeah, they already too. have, the outdoor facility. Yeah. So there's only Framingham, right? And then the outdoor facility is in, right, but they're not closing the outdoor. Oh, it okay. would be That's, in addition to okay. that wonderful faci facility. It's beautiful. Yes. That's what I was thinking. Yeah. Right. But it, it's limited in terms of their vision around the other types of, and they did a wonderful presentation, just um, the things that they're doing. You know, they kind of talked about how people typically think of the Y, the YMCA, um, based on the experiences that we've had with the organization growing up, perhaps, um, but how much more they're doing um, intergenerationally mm -hmm. now uh, was very impressive. Seems awesome. like a great opportunity. 
I mean, my thought when I looked at the survey was that in the current condition, and I've seen it closely, it's hard to imagine. I mean, we would have a similar situation as we've had at the town hall where something breaks or leaks, right? And that's where I was hesitant to make any recommendation with the current condition. And so if we are going to put in a lot of money to renovate and whatnot, then obviously there are lots of options. Like all, all the things that you've listed. With your permission, can I put that on, on under number seven that says, do you have any concerns about the use of center school building and grounds? Because I think that's a great point. Yeah. Yeah, it requires Town hall just renovation. Yeah, nothing's I mean, really feasible without renovation. Right. 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 Significant and, renovation. Yeah. Right, and we know it gets super hot and cold too. And um, I think I've heard that every other day there's something or the other going on. Right. It's an exciting place to be. <laughs> I, I, oh, yeah. We did see the closet and things like, yeah, we saw places that, yeah, where there were there are issues that, you know, it'll be nice to have the kids in Marathon well, as a result of these issues. It's such an exciting opportunity, though. I mean, I can't wait to go into the library and see how they sort of maintained the old and beautiful mm -hmm. character of the building, but it's a modern and state-of-the-art facility. And, I mean, so it's just we have the opportunity to do that again, and it, it's great that they're having all these conversations. Um, I hope they pick all my ideas, but I can't, I can't <laughs> wait to I see what like, they come up with. I do like what you talked about, the 18 to 22-year-olds. Yeah. Uh, I think that's a good one. All right. And, of course, a couple of other ones with regard to the parking. Of course, keeping the gym open. So I don't think we're at a point where we need to take a formal vote on that, but you got the gist of uh, Definitely. Our, uh, and if you have any other ideas or suggestions... You know, we can certainly I'll pass them on. And just in terms of follow up, you'll you'll just update them. I don't need to respond to the email. Correct. Email. Yep. Okay. I'll I'll forward it on. Yep. Okay. Awesome. Okay. So I think that brings us. Unless there are other liaison reports. I just wanted to give a quick yes, update on the ESY uh, subcommittee that I participated in over the summer. We met for our final uh, committee meeting on Tuesday, and we'll bring Dr. Zaleski will bring forward the guidelines that the group worked on as to the school committee next month and then um, we will have an opportunity to look at our red line version of the policy we looked at back in April. Okay. Great. Anything else? ESPC. I did. So ESPC, um, hold on. It's a fun to show. There was um, a lot of discussion about um, <laughs> dishwashers, pretty much. Um, so uh, everything is still, you know, status quo, ahead of schedule, under budget, going great. Building is at about 52% completion. Um, and um, so the big discussion was um, that a great idea and something that had was, you know, sort of didn't even cross anybody's mind, I don't think, until it was mentioned at that meeting, was that um, we in our cafeteria still use styrofoam trays and we dispose... Um, I wrote this number down, Susan, because I was um, 186,000 styrofoam trays every year we toss. And um, so the idea was to install a dishwasher. Thank you for this. Yeah, I had the same reaction. That's awesome. <laughs> Everyone else in the room had this stern face, and I'm thinking, I don't have stern face right now. I have, so it, um, so the the fact that there wasn't a dishwasher in the, the plans that, um, up until this point, anyway, uh, was noted, and so there was a long discussion about this discussion about dishwashers. Um, the what it came down to is basically the incremental cost of not having put it in the plans and now putting into the plans was somewhere between ten and twenty thousand dollars. So it was a long discussion, but ultimately, um, when we voted on it, it passed three to two. So there will be a dishwasher at the Marathon School, and they will have trays that can be washed and not disposable um, styrofoam trays. So you missed a good one, John. <laughs> and we should credit. Yes, so Susan was the one who yes. made the initial presentation with Tim, alongside Tim, and she, um, she had the numbers, she had, um, it, it was just Fascinating to listen to the you know the costs of the styrofoam trays versus the cost of the of the um, plastic trays and and you know why wasn't in there before we, we you know halfway through the meeting we're like if two years ago or three years ago <laughs> that could have been put into the plan. But we don't. Do we have them at other schools? No, but 
Right. She so has the, a plan. The, right. So that's she that's what I was saying. Like this is this is born of a potential philosophical change in the way we're, we're exactly. doing all this. That's why it wasn't exactly. in there two years ago. And, Correct. Yeah. Yep. And the fact that you, I mean, after how many months have you been? Four months? Just got in there and we're, you know, oh, yeah. like, hey, we, we kind of need a dishwasher in this um, in this plan. It was, a, it was great. So there was a lot of discussion, um, but ultimately there will be a dishwasher at Marathon School. Very this exciting. is exciting stuff, Jen. I know, right? I know. <laughs> it is exciting. <laughs> That's... It was good, but everything else is it is great. They're moving along. I'll just because I was there too, and to your point, John, and, and we should recognize that um, one of the things we discussed at was the responsiveness of this committee over time. The fact that, as we've said, this this project takes a really long time, and the people who are sitting around the, that table have been doing so for ever since before I even started here so it's a lot of time from that committee it was it was started just in 2013 mm -hmm. and um and so one of the things that we discussed was the responsiveness responsiveness of this committee to the changes that have been brought to them of necessity over time because as time has passed so too did the need to go back and look at well maybe we can ex expand the building and that that you know the committee responded to that they responded to a, a recent request around sinks um, that would allow you know for for um, in the kindergarten classroom so I think this is another example with updated information um, and opportunity and the right timing within the project they were able to make a decision that that made sense now that didn't make sense two years ago and I think when you said that, I think that s struck a chord with a lot of people. I think your presentation struck, a, Susan, struck a chord with a lot of people. I think even something as small as Lauren saying that these little kids, uh, the styrofoam trays are difficult for them to manage. They dump their food. And to have something sturdy to carry could make yeah. a world of difference to these little kids who are trying to get to their tables. Yeah. Um, so I think you know all of that contributed to it. And the Can environmental just... impact. And the environmental impact for so, sure. So I was unfortunately out of state, so I wasn't at the meeting. It does sound like I missed a good one, but I just for the committee's benefit, I didn't. It just pulled up the the rough here. Um, so as you said, the 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 nominal the cost of putting it in now versus putting it at the beginning was like ten to twenty thousand, but the overall is going to cost this almost two hundred k, right? Correct. Right. So that's I just I feel like I feel like we've that's got five people sitting here, try, my, my, or th people might be sitting here trying to figure out why two people voted against this when it was ten to yes. twenty thousand dollars on a project that's that big. It is actually adding two hundred thousand dollars to the project cost. It just that would have added two hundred thousand dollars to the project cost a couple of years ago had we done it then. The difference between doing it now and doing it then is ten to twenty thousand dollars. Right. Okay. So I thought that was the overall cost. Of my and, and when you're looking that. at the types of trays, would you please consider stainless steel, if possible, rather than plastic? I don't know what the cost implications would be. Just throwing it out there. We'll, we'll be looking at, um, you know, what they call the small wares for the kitchen um, coming up. Okay. Yeah, we, I mean, we, we hear so much about plastics and, mm -hmm. you know, and putting them through dishwashers and stuff. Mm -hmm. like that. That's a good point. Right. Okay, anybody else? So I'll move on quickly to my chair report, and I first have to sadly announce that it's 9 o'clock and the spoonery is closed, and we will not be attending. We will not be having ice cream after our meeting, but we can try again for the next time. Um, so I had the fortune of um, attending the social-emotional learning event that Senator Spilka offered to school committee members. I went in on Tuesday into Boston, into the State House, um, and it was very interesting. Um, there was a presentation from a woman who works in the Framingham schools and she was talking about social emotional learning and um, anytime that it's so rare and also so powerful to have the opportunity to be in the room with other school committee members from other districts because we have so much in common and so little interaction with each other and so it's just really helpful to hear what other people are doing and um, so it was a really great event as usual I came home I texted Kathy on my way home. We're so much better than everybody else, which I can only say because they can't see the cam. Um, but she seriously did. And Southboro wasn't there, so um, I just—I'm just always struck at how far ahead of the curve 
we are in Hopkinton, and that's just a credit to our administrative team. They're just so forward thinking, and just so much of the work that we are doing, mm -hmm. people are just starting to say, oh, this seems like a really good idea, and I'm like, we've had that for five years. So anyways, that was fantastic, and I'm sure that the, it was very well received, and I know that they're going to plan more of them, and probably out here in um, more convenient locations so hopefully all of us will have the opportunity to go to a, a few over the course of the year um, so that was that and then I also received in the mail my annual and enticing inv invitation to the MASC MASS joint conference um, so I'm just putting that out there I don't probably you all got this in the mail it's November 1st um, we are able to send one or two representatives of our school committee if we are so inclined um, we typically don't we sometimes do so if you didn't get this you can take mine but you can look through and see what um, what the um, I'm losing the word but what they're voting on this year what the different not initiatives isn't the right word but um, doesn't matter it's in the book uh, so let, just if you're interested let me know because I, I do believe we have money in the budget for that we do. but we don't typically we don't typically go but it's it's nice and, and again it's just a great opportunity to, to learn from other school committee members and other towns um, so that's something to think about so then the other things that I'm talking about are superintendent search which I think I'll just defer that to our agenda item we have a lot of we're gonna vote on at least one thing but we have a lot of all of those things are in the packet for that and then we have updated our budget timeline and that was in your packet um, and so I don't think we need to vote on this necessarily right but we just wanted to have everybody else's eyes on it one more time make sure there's nothing else that jumps out at any of us um, it, we did add the actual date for the that town meeting begins so late this year um, but it should all be here so unless there are any corrections that anybody mm -hmm. saw that we need to make to this um, then I would say it's ready to be posted on our website and once that's done I I'm gonna try to really um, push a lot of information out this year to the Board of Selectmen so I will send them the link um, and remind them of the invitation to come to our meeting on January 4th um, so once it's posted, I'll do that unless anybody had anything that they noted that needs to be updated. Okay. No, but so are we going to have a tab this year for the budget? I know some years we've had a tab specific yes. on the web page so for the budget. Megan and I looked at that, and um, we have, I think the, that the documents from last year were not actually on there, but there were the two fiscal years prior to that. So rather than upload everything from last year, we just decided we're going to start fresh um, from this year. So we sense. have already yeah. um, talked Fantastic. about that. But yeah, but that's why I wanted to send them the link so that they sort of get oriented towards looking towards that um, drop down on our on our website. So that was my um, quick report and Dr. McLeod do you have a report I do I'll be brief um, it seems impossible that um, we're almost finished September and that I, I, my report was really about back to school but just wonderful participation great events um, had they're not all quite finished I know center schools is is next week right and Elmwood still to go and Elmwood, Elmwood the first week yeah um, so a lot of a lot of excitement around that I have not spoken to a parent who has not been delighted so double negative there for you but just the responses have been so positive about the, how happy their children are what great experiences they're having at the schools how great the administration is just all positive um, and lots of excitement around that I know that Hopkins school is doing their um, all school their first all school event what color is your child orange 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 tomorrow morning I'm it's gla bright glad you knew what the answer Mr. Graziano <laughs> okay that's You'll good see him from space he will show up <laughs> that's very exciting so um, that should be a, a great event tomorrow morning uh, we had our first home football game the field looked fantastic Yay. Um, and uh, again, there's all there's so many kudos going out to our new uh, director of buildings and grounds and and finance and operations director, but just really paying attention and making sure that we could be proud of that field. Um, we we all got a text from D, even though, or I guess it was from Tim, 
because Dee was uh, Tim, at a wedding. Tim, Tim started it. So Tim was there, yeah, just to, at opening. And just to have the lights on the field and to just feel so proud about that beautiful greenness was awesome. And we, I, we I, the game was, I don't know, 42 to nothing. Yeah. Was that the right score? Wow. Yeah. And the band, I heard there were like 120 or so people in the band playing at football. <gasps> really? That's fabulous. Amazing. That's great spirit. And it was a beautiful night. So that was that was a wonderful way to start. Um, and then today, we, the three of us and the principals, uh, the, so participation from the, um, the school safety task force, um, along with fire and police, participated in a town emergency management state training. Um, I know that the fire and police, the fire department actually has been really um, at the center of this incident command training and wanting to make sure that we had that, those communications in place. And uh, so there was great participation. When they first planned it for the 21st, and it sounded like so far away back in the summer, um, we had forgotten or had not yet realized that it would be a non-school day for students. So it was a lot for our principals to give up this day in September for a time when they could have gotten caught up on so many things um, to, to participate in it. But it was greatly appreciated by, um, by both the fire and police department and um, town manager was there, um, representative from um, the buildings, uh, not buildings and grounds, DPW, John Westerling was there, um, Dave, Dave Taltorio, of course. So just cross town um, department representation at, at this meeting. Um, and other than it being freezing cold, <laughs> oh, it was it was uh, time well spent. So that's my report. Thank you. All right. So new business. Um, we have policy JLA Wellness. You wanna? I'll just begin by saying on page three. I will note that on page three, um, whenever we call out people's names. So this, this um, policy was put together by the, the Wellness Committee um, and also updated by the same committee who are made up of teachers at the high school. Um, it's headed by the uh, subject matter leader, so Bruce Elliott was really instrumental in doing this work along with his team before he left. Um, but one of the things that I noted in just preparing for tonight was and I think we've done this before with other policies, is that when there, there's information that includes individual people's names as opposed to their roles, mm -hmm. it means that we have to go back often to review it. So this is a page that is it's completely outdated, um, page three, that had not been redlined. Um, and I'll just add that to the discussion. Um, you can see the redlined recommendations. Again, it is the work of the group that used this document most. Um, and have created it. I know, Mina, you had a question about the, um, you referenced, I'll let you ask sure. the question. Um, I, I think I mentioned that, uh, you know, first of all, it's a very well thought out policy. Um, and there's a reference to Dr. Bill Hetler's wellness hexagon. Correct. And when I look, at, uh, when I looked it up, it talks about other aspects like emotional, social, spiritual wellness as well. And there's one reference to the bullying policy in the um, in this. This seems to be more focused on the physical aspects of wellness, right? Mm -hmm. um, so are there others that we should be referencing back? Because I know there's a lot of work that's being done around emotional, social. I don't know so much about the spiritual wellness part, uh, but uh, and also the occupational and intellectual wellness. We know we have heard um, about the anxiety to perform, for instance right uh, from Denise and I was just wondering do we have any policies which are capturing some of these other aspects of that hexagon I think that's a great question for Jen to your left <laughs> so um, <laughs> interesting about this policy so when um, we were reviewing the policies and, and looking for things that may need updating this was, um, I was still getting my password from MSBA. I got it last week, finally, so I could actually go in and look at their suggested policies and see what um, a wellness policy would look like. And so, um, stepping back to when we first read this, one of the questions was, is this really policy or is it, or is it more of a report? Mm -hmm. There's there are SMART goals in here and there's um, there are dates that are you know a few years old. 
Um, so my question was, is, it, is this really a policy or is it more of a report or some kind of guiding document for um, the, the district, this a particular school? Um, also interesting that I found out last weekend is that JLA is a policy is actually for student insurance program. So the policy is actually a different policy letter. And so, and, and the suggestion is quite many of the same things that are in here, but quite different. And it includes social emotional peace, mental health. Um, so I guess that was one of the things that flagged it for us in the policy meetings is, is this really policy? And if it isn't, maybe we could, could suggest or work on one, but maybe this isn't it. Maybe this is more of a guiding document for the policy. Because the bulk of the red line is just referencing the wellness guidelines and protocols, right? So I, right. That, that, so uh, to me, that actually, because I had the same, uh, very similar question, and uh, right. to me that almost answers it. I mean, the fact that in every section where we have something, it says, please see Hopkins Public yeah. Schools wellness school guidelines and protocols. Right. It's also much longer than our policy. Typical policy, mm -hmm. correct. Yeah. yeah. I, I think it's very detailed. It is, which, and I think I, I don't dismiss the importance of the details, but I, I share with Jen's question about whether it's maybe more uh, guidelines than it is. It, it, and I do think that, to go back to what you said, that there are other things that could be included in it as part of the guidelines, but maybe not, it, it may be just miss placed in where it belongs in our stuff. Right. I think we've made, you know, in the intervening years, we've definitely made an effort to move towards streamlining the policies to be sort of at a higher level and then implementing, you know, procedures or guidelines or whatever else needs to be in place to support it um, because those can be more flexible and more easily changed. I agree there's too much in here and it's, I mean, even if we were to keep it in this structure, we'd have to do a lot of updating, but yeah, I mean, we don't have SMART goals in any of other policies or people's names or, or anything like that. So, um, and I also think that that you, Mina and, and um, Jen, you've made a good point that this isn't so much about social emotional learning. It's interesting, you can see just in the four years how that's immediately at the top of our mind now and wasn't really even part of the conversation um, such a short time ago. And so I think, I think sort of starting from scratch with a more top level um, policy and then seeing what we need to maintain, I, I think this would be a great opportunity for our new wellness director to sort of take this and incorporate that into a plan or a recommendation or just a report update to us. Um, so sort of more of a status quo of what's happening now. Uh -huh. I mean, this is fairly current. So this oh, okay. is something that had just been updated by Bruce. <clears throat> oh, okay. Um, it's, and by the, by, by the people in the department. I don't know if that okay. changes anything. No, just maybe the reorganization of it would yeah. be yeah. Yeah. Okay. helpful. And I mean, I appreciate the references, and I think it's good to, to have research-based practices, mm -hmm. but I don't know that we need the references in the policy. Yeah, so I'm, I think just to kind of restructure it a little bit. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Break it down to something simple for the policy itself. And yeah. Move exactly. that into more of guidelines. Is there anything else? That Is there a motion, a motion on that? I, I, well, I would think, do you want to bring it back with the policy and a sure. substitute policy? Yeah, yeah that seems like um, okay. we're not really ready to vote okay. on anything. So and I'll follow up okay. with Jen on what we should be calling it. That was an easy one. Um, okay, so policy BEDH public pol public participation at committee meetings. Do you want to? I'll just kick it off, here. kick it off to uh, remind everybody, um, and please my fellow um, working group, whatever we're calling ourselves, for <clears throat> the yeah, committee work. Acronym. Yes, um, but this really is in front of you um, to consider, and we were, we were concerned about um, reminding those who participate in public comment, who do not do it often, who might be here, and um, in expressing concerns may not um, be aware of or remember to think about um, 
privacy as it relates to student individual names of people that they're they're commenting about at public comment, uh, particularly students. And so the committee um, had had thought about whether there could be something in this policy, um, possibly even some kind of a reminder that would would be uh, something that could be placed maybe either on our agenda under public comment um, was an idea um, or or in a, some other fashion um, to protect privacy. Mm -hmm. I think that was kind of it. Yeah, I, I think that's a great suggestion and it's definitely um, that has happened yes. many times. Yes. Right. And the, the other thing, once we do update the policy, I think it would be helpful just to, you always have your big box of school committee meeting things, just to leave copies in there. So for yeah. when people are attending, we can hand out the policy mm -hmm. in advance and they can have a chance to read it before they come up and talk. Right. So that we're not having to interrupt and say, oh, you're not allowed to say that or, mm -hmm. um, or whatever. But um, so I, I completely agree that that's something that we need to add in here. Are there other things that we feel like are missing? Um, I, I have a suggestion. I mean, um, I felt like while we're talking to the participation and, you know, what is the process, I was thinking about the, uh, the matter that has been brought forth by the public, right? How are we addressing it? And can there be a few lines that speak to it? Because many times you don't immediately, you know, respond to it, right? So right. can we say something to that effect that this is a meeting that's ongoing because many times we don't take those on, right, immediately. We just hear them. At least that's what I've seen. So just to add something to that effect. So I, I don't know that I'd support putting that in policy, though, because there are times where somebody will come to a public comment and we there may not be any action to address their public comment. And I just worry about putting that in policy and creating the expectation that we have to respond in some form to every public comment. I think that if it requires a response, we should respond. So I agree with you in practice. I'm just saying if we put it in policy, we have to respond. And there are times when it, when, I mean, I can't think of an example off the top of my head, but there are people who come to public comment that it doesn't warrant a response from this committee. And if it doesn't, we get back and I, I think we can say that, right? So, so I think one I thing know, that I yeah. hear that I, I think you're getting at is there are some things that are brought before the committee that we can't deliberate about in the moment because it would violate open meeting law if we start, if somebody brings an agenda item forward that they want us to discuss, we can't necessarily discuss it as a committee, mm -hmm. even if we wanted to, and, and typically time doesn't allow for a large discussion anyway. But is that sort of what? Right, I, I guess all I'm saying is that while we are telling the public, okay, this is the protocol you need to follow, I think we just need to say our protocol for response. And we can just say that in certain instances it may not require response, but where there is a response needed, maybe we get back by the next meeting and we address that matter or between then and that time or we determine by when we get back. I just felt like something to that effect of how we would address, if someone gives a comment and you say, okay, comment noted and move on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, so I just, go ahead, sorry. Well, so maybe you can structure it in a way where you say something like, you know, comments will be taken under advisement and if further, if follow-up action is required, um, a response may be placed on a future agenda or something like that. But I, I agree, you don't want to... I just worry about codifying it policy. I, I, yeah. Again, it's not that I don't... I, I agree with the practice that we should be prompt in responding and handling it correctly as necessary, but one of the things I know, uh, Jean, you and I are probably, the, Jean and Kathy and I are probably the ones who have, have lived this, but over the last three or four years, a lot of our policy work has actually been to make sure that we we thin policy to the point of the pieces that should be a policy rather than a practice. Mm -hmm. And so that's I, I that that's my concern with this one. If I'm the only one, then I'm the only one. But that's okay. I agree with what you're saying and, and concerned about putting our expanding the policy too much but I do also think that to Mina's point our and, and as you know our, the practice has been that we have brought things back yeah. as necessary and maybe it would be some something as simple as the chair in, in practice not as part of the policy but the chair 
thank you, you know, and then we'll take it under advisement. Mm -hmm. Would be my. Does that satisfy? Are you? Yeah, no, I'm just bringing it up. I just felt like, uh, you know, the example that comes to mind is like the AP bio parents, right, if I may take that example. They brought up a concern. Obviously, there was some work that was already done. We all talked about it. And uh, Dr. McLeod and Dr. Kavanaugh brought back the response in the next meeting or so. Right. So we that does happen, mm -hmm. right? And I guess as a policy, we would, if someone brings up something, we would take it into consideration or it does carry some weight. That's where I was coming from. But fine, if you want to keep it there. Um, well, so I guess I think my suggestion is why don't, so who, who's going to be working on the revision? Is that you, Jen? You and Kathy? Are you, Nancy, Nancy and Kathy. And Nancy. And yeah. So, well, why don't you let that percolate and we'll see how it looks when it comes back. I think I, I, I totally agree with John. I don't want to put anything in there that um, is so narrowly defined as everything requires a future agenda item or a response. But I also do think that it, I've always felt that it's a very awkward um, situation and we typically don't have much if any of a response and the moment and I think that people don't it's a little jarring for people because they don't it's, it's not usually how a conversation goes so I think in terms of setting expectations um, I think if we can maybe reach a middle ground or try to reach a middle ground that might be um, helpful because I and I, I, I sort of feel like that's kind of the same purpose of putting in the thing about not speaking to certainly individual students or staff um, because again it, it's really difficult to interrupt people and start down a whole new path of don't say that name or whatever um, so I think in terms of setting expectations not just in terms of what um, our requirements are for participation but also what they can expect back or maybe not um, might be good so I, I actually thank you for pointing that out uh, we will it so happened that we had a, a AP bio on the agenda that day right. that's why we talked about it a little but if not we would have just heard it and said okay yeah and well so I, I, and but, I don't, but I will say I will say that, that, so because to your point when I first got on the committee it was terrible like, like they would, people would come and they would public comment, and we would literally just like stare at them, and that they would leave. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not exaggerating. No, you're not. <laughs> and it was so I, I think what we have become, become much, much better at is, so the AP bio happened to be on the agenda, but I can tell you that from a practice perspective, had it not been, I'm sure that Dr. McLeod or Dr. Kavanaugh would have said, this is something that's been brought to our attention. We're working on something. We'll come back to you. Or sometimes when we're caught completely off guard, it'll sort of be between the chair and the superintendent to say, you know, who will take that back. So I, I think we've we've gotten tremendously better at, at, the, at the practice of that, which is a positive. Yeah. yeah. No, I agree. But, about that. Yeah. Yeah. but we also, I mean, they, you know, again, just to set the expectation that we do have a business meeting to conduct we do have to post our agenda two days in advance we are limited to those topics and so again I just don't think that that's really intuitive to people who are coming because they're you know passionate about something for some reason and that's a an important and legitimate thing to communicate to us it's just such an awkward structure that this is I mean and we didn't invent it this is in the open meeting law right but like so it's just not it's not how normal conversation goes. So as clear as we can be in the policy, just in terms of setting expectations, I think that sounds like that's what we're all trying to do. Sure. So that people uh, don't think we're not answering because we're never going to answer. Because we don't, we don't care. I would, say, no, we care. I would say one of the, just highlighted in terms of positive changes, one of the, the, the changes that we made a few years ago that it's not oft used, but I really like that we put it there, yeah. which is the second public comment opportunity. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. one of the things that used to happen is if there was an issue we were going to deal with where there was going to be significant public comment, they would come at the beginning. Sometimes they would comment because they, they knew that they could. And then we'd talk about it, and they would have no opportunity to react to what happened in the meeting. Exactly. So I think we've gotten some instances where people have come up to the second public comment to react to the actions we've taken, and I think that's been positive for our for our interactions at this meeting with our vast audience. Yes. <laughs> well, all there, there will be days yeah. when we have people. Right. Yes. Again, we can hope. Yes, but to absolutely. include 
sorry, but to include something about specifically about the na names, especially of minors and and children. That's you're amenable to that. We can work on something maybe Definitely. to put it. Okay. And then there is really there is reference to complaints about school personnel, but even I, I, I don't know. I agree. And personnel. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean there's, there's a specific. Th that's already a little bit touched on in there, but maybe that's similar language you can use. But particularly, mm -hmm. even you know, I think it's difficult for people to, uh, even when it's their own child. You it's know, hard not to use it's, the it's, name. It's right. you know, I guess it's their right to share that information, but we can't comment back. Well, and that's what it, part of the, my motivation was wondering if, you know, you forget that it's on a camera and it's public and it's anyone can see it and it's on YouTube. So really anyone yes, can anyone see it. Can see and it. so even as a parent, you might forget that in the moment and not realize you've just said your child's name and want to take it back afterwards and there's no taking it back. So just even a reminder before they speak something just so... Yeah they wouldn't do it unwittingly kind of yeah i like the idea of having the the, the paper copies on hand to distribute yeah, as well yeah, I, mean, yeah. I think back back when we used to print out paper copies of the agenda to have at the meeting right they we used it was to actually used to be on the back some guy yeah some guidelines on there so i think it'll be helpful some, some laminated sheets yeah. <laughs> there you go like turn the laminate maybe we can all just wear t-shirts <laughs> say what the rules are okay so do we get all that all right so we'll work on that yes Okay, so we'll move on to the CPC application. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't even ask you. Did you have anything to add? Okay. Um, so the CPC application, you have it in your packet. Um, we did submit this in order to meet their deadline. Uh, it was called a draft op application. So um, if there's anything that you, you know, disagree with, I, I believe we have the opportunity. We have not gone yet to meet with them, so certainly we have the opportunity to amend the um, application, but um, the uh, athletic field subcommittee did review um, the application at its last meeting, which was on the 15th. Oh, sorry. I don't remember. I don't remember it was, either. I think it was this week. Was it, was it Monday? The, it was. This has been a long no, week. it was long last week. Friday. Was, was it the last 15th. Friday? Okay. Um, anyway, they uh, voted unanimously to support the application. Um, and uh, and we d and as I said, we don't have a date yet for when we'll go to um, have the discussion with CPC. But so we wanted to put it in the packet for you to read it and understand it, enjoy it. And um, so if anybody has questions or anything that they would like to talk about, we yes, can do as that. As always, I yes. don't disappoint. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I did enjoy reading it. Um, now, in terms of the project description, you had mentioned that it's been several years um, since it's been on the capital sheet. Can we be specific, like how many years has it been since it's been on the capital? Or ten, ten years? I would have to go back and look. It's as long as I've been on the committee. Uh, yeah. yeah. Maybe possibly as long as I've been on. So I, the, the yeah. thing about it, I mean, it's sort of just always kind of been out there. It was never targeted. Sure. If it was targeted in a year, it gets it's it been getting bulk. pushed out. Yeah, I see. So I don't know. I think it actually was already on when I came on the committee. So I don't really know specifically how long. Yeah, I mean, it would be helpful, and I, I don't know how the sheet is managed yet. Um, I don't know that yet personally. But to have kind of you know the initiation date of that idea. Yeah, that's a really that, good idea. Because that would help people understand that how long this need has been identified and the need existed and we've waited on it for all this while. That's a really good point, just in general for our capital spreadsheet, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, no, that's a really good point. And I, I can go back and look at old copies because I happen to have all of my files, as we discussed earlier, so I can see. But that's, I mean, that's certainly something that I can um, explain to them when we go and meet with them. That's um, a good suggestion. And, and, um, how are these projects prioritized? Like, how did we prioritize this? I, I, that's more a general question I have. If you think we should take that offline, I, I can do that, just to understand. You mean, in general, how do we prioritize our capital the projects? Ca this item has been sitting there for so many years. Well, I mean, just really quickly, typically, you know, as part of the budget process, um, the administration will bring forward the list of capital projects, and we sort of do some juggling based on what the forecasts are for the town. And, um, you know, I think it's not a surprise to say that a lot of, depending on, in between budgets and um, the fact that we, you know, our highest priority has been replacing the center school, that 
that's really been those two things probably have been the major drivers of what we decided to put forward each year and then some things just don't work anymore and have some things become critical um, so I, I mean I think that that's a good um, topic for discussion too because I know Tim and Susan are really doing a deeper dive on all of our capital assets um, so I think maybe we should have a, a like a deeper conversation about how we're going to prioritize all those things once we could get a look at that which I know is not going to be in this budget cycle this is really going to be focused on the one year um, so that will be your guys responsibility next year but um, yeah, I think it's a good question um, I had a few more so the way I read it I felt like um, about 1.1 million would be raised through sponsorship which I think is exciting. Can I be excited about it? Well, so that is at the bottom of the line that says town meeting appropriation and corporate sponsorships. Oh, so I saw I it right next to the sponsorship. Yes. 1.1 million sponsorship is, I would describe as That would as be aggressive. a lofty goal. Yeah. <laughs> Why not? Yeah. Aim high. We would certainly not turn that down. Right. And that's why we have been working on our advertising policy to make sure that we are in a position to be able to accept sponsorships. But... Um, yeah, that would be great. Yeah. Do we need any help? Like, do you need, do you want to reach out to folks in the community and say, can folks help us with raising? So the, sub so the subcommittee's working on that. All right. Yeah, awesome. the subcommittee's working yes, on that. We do. Awesome. We have, we've, t we've identified a couple of people. And in fact, that's that. specifically why we have somebody on the committee with um, financial experience. That was that's one awesome. of the profiles that we looked for. And there was um, 343,000 odd dollars which were listed in the spreadsheet which were not covered in the 3.8. So what would be the source of that funds for that? So amount? those are things that were that are not currently in the project. Right, John? The 343? Yeah. The, at the bottom, bottom of this, yeah. On, outside the, yeah. So, I mean, either we may not need them or those would be great um, opportunities for donation or or both you know so right now we're not contemplating those things but they'd be nice to have mm -hmm. yeah well they may be nice to have uh, some of them she pulled out because some of them are related to equipment and we maybe already have it so like scoreboard for example we have a scoreboard right, right, on okay. field three we can just probably update that we were talking about could we repurpose there is a scoreboard on field four and we've been talking about could we repurpose that and at our meeting on Friday the um, conversation really was about well probably not however we might be able to move the solar powered scoreboard from field two down there and not need to buy a new scoreboard so that's why some things are sort of uh, you know basically topics for later discussion and I guess one thought that goes along with the prioritization and this project in general is to just see testimonials from parents and students on why they think this is needed and lost opportunities because this field has not been in place. I think that would so, help yeah, a lot. That's so, a I, I think, so I, I think it's important to separate kind of what we're doing here yeah. versus the larger project. Okay. So we're just getting ourselves in the cycle with the CTC so that we can start having discussions with them about potentially partially funding it. So the subcommittee is actually working towards a forum, which we should have brought up in our liaison report. We should have mentioned that report, in our liaison report. Um, is working towards a forum to start engaging the community in this conversation. And the big, the, the big sort of topic areas for the forum are going to be the financial structure of it. So cost, revenue, replacement cycles, um, sponsorship opportunities, um, and then the other one of the other big other ones is going to be utilization and availability as the major driver for the need for this. So um, D. King has just a ton of information from last spring about availability problems. So that's all that's the subcommittee's working right. on that. So it's which it's great feedback. I don't want to, but I just want to make sure we're sort of that this is just to get us in the cycle with the CPC for, sure. for funding. Right. That you're right, John. That's what we're focused on in this part of the agenda although we should have said that and we should have set a report and, and done yeah. that and the other piece of what I want to add on to what he said is we um, are either live or ready to go live with our website and our web page and our Facebook page and so you will be seeing information um, of that nature on there it's 
you know, it's just the bare minimum right now, and it'll be built on. But, um, but absolutely, that's been part of the discussion. That's I awesome. Think. And and again, please don't misunderstand. I'm not saying that you're not doing all of this. Research. Oh no. No, I know. I just yeah. Well, that's why we should have right. updated you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we could have, we could have, yeah. I'm just curious. I yeah. just would love to hear it yeah. from you know the kids. No, absolutely. Not not being involved in this, and so it would help a lot. All right. Any other questions about? Our CPC application. All right, so um, I am looking for a motion to approve the CPC application for the athletic fields phase one permit. So moved. And second. a second. Okay, so motion by Ms. Cavanaugh, second by Mr. Graziano. All in favor? Yes. 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 Okay, any opposed? So that is unanimous. Okay, oh, approval of accounts payable warrants. <laughs> Um, so this will wake us up. Yeah, yeah this will wake you up. <laughs> so there's a, um, the Municipal Modernization Act, which is difficult to say. Um, one of the things that they're looking at in, in terms of streamlining efficiency of government, and one of the um, passages that they put forward with that act was that government boards, multiple um, person boards, um, now can select one person to sign um, the accounts payable warrants so that the warrants then can be processed uh, and vendors can, can get paid. Similar to what we now do for payroll. Um, so mm -hmm. they did that for payroll a long time ago. They're only just now catching up and doing that for the accounts payable warrants. Um, so needless to say, from an efficiency standpoint for our, for our point, um, moving bills out of the department weekly and having yeah. checks cut weekly um, really streamlines everything that happens in, in our office, cuts down on vendor phone calls. Yeah, a perfect example last week, um, Apple was calling on the payments that were on the last warrant. They called the tech department, they called accounts payable, they called me, they called the manager, and all four of us called them back. So these are the things that we're trying to take out. Um, so, and this act actually now has finally provided the vehicle for that to happen. So just, I had one quick question. So you're looking then for us to designate one person like you typically go and you sign, but now if for some reason the one person is out of town or whatever, somebody else could go in their place then Correct. the same So you can, you can designate one person and you can designate an alternate. alternate. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. And it should be school committee members, both, right? Yeah. It would seem like it, um, so that this doesn't have to come back, it would be easier to just designate the chair. Mm -hmm. And then have the, the, vice, the vice chair, chair is the second alternate. alternate, just so that it then you don't have to come back next year in the event that Jean might not be the chair next year. Right. So make it the role as opposed to the person. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just one quick question. So what we've done with pay in payroll, we've done something similar, but then in a pinch, it, some, it, it, it. Uh, any committee member can sign yeah. if we need to. Is that work in this case too? Like Jean and Nancy are both out of town and you need a warrant signed. I, I think because it is your board, Yeah. Is you can make that as, okay. as so a backup is, okay. as long yeah. as you know that someone from your board right. is right. going to sign. So that certainly is within your purview to, to make that vote. Seems like okay. the wisest. Right. Yeah, I mean, it's, again, probably less urgent than payroll in most cases. We've had those where, like, we need somebody to sign this or we're not cut check. <laughs> um, but, but I think it, yeah, it makes sense just in case. Right. Okay. Chair, vice chair. Either of them are not available then. Right. Any committee member. Okay. Um, and then it says this in the memo, but I'll just say it for public too. The warrants will still come in the um, in the packets. We'll still all see them. Do we still all sign them after that? Seems you redundant. don't all sign them. So it would be um, so it could if it's the chair, it would be part of the chair's report. Oh, I get it. Warrant dated X for X amount of money. Okay. Um, so it's basically read into the minutes. Oh, okay, perfect. But then still, every all the school committee members will get the full warrant, so they can read through it. Exactly. Okay. It would all be part of the packet. Okay. 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 Very good. Any other questions? 
All right. I think, John, you sounded like you really were nailing how to craft so, this motion. So why don't you go for it? So I don't have the, the base to read from because my laptop did die. Oh, no. So, um, so I would move that the school committee approve the chair to sign accounts payable warrants on behalf of the school committee in the case that the chair is not available, the vice chair would sign in the case that neither is available, any other school committee member can sign the warrants. Oh, that's very nicely done. Second? Second. Okay. All in favor? Yes. 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 Okay. That is unanimous. Congratulations. I'll see you on Friday <laughs> <laughs> or whatever day. Um, okay. And I will add that to the agenda planning document so that we don't forget to put that under your report going forward. Yeah, that's great. So if Megan can just tell me, yep. we'll exactly. get standard language yep. and we it'll will. be super easy. Okay. I know she's probably already finished that. Yeah, probably got it done. <laughs> <laughs> that would be my guess. Okay, so moving on to, to old business. Um, the school committee policy GCRD tutoring. This is our oh. second reading. Yes, and I should have asked you at the beginning whether you re re you received any emails about any of the uh, policies. I received zero emails okay. about policies. So this has been shared uh, with the HPTA. Um, they didn't have any questions. Basically, what this is asking us to do is um, there were just a couple of... Oh, so the changes, we actually didn't have a policy. Yes, sorry for all the mumbling along here, stuttering along. The policy that you see that is not redlined is the policy that we are asking you to approve. This is, would be a new policy for us, GCRD. Um, we created it from a model policy from the MASC, which is redlined in your packet um, and in the packet for those who are following along. Um, the changes that we had are recommending um, were really to meet our practice and the ways in which we felt that it would most clearly define the issue around teachers tutoring students and um, what would be allowable and what would not be allowable within the conflict of interest law. And so as you see it, without the red line is, is the cleanest way, but the reason it looks the way it does is because we were modeling it after another previously developed policy. Does anybody have questions? I just have one thing in this um, second sentence. In the uh, on the first mm -hmm. line, at uh, the first sentence we say his or her, and then in the second sentence we say his slash her. Mm -hmm. I don't know if we need to be consistent. Okay. Yep. Um, Good point. And I don't know if we need to. This is a larger topic, probably for another day, but I don't know if we need to be broader in our use of pronouns going forward. Mm. Mm. I don't mm -hmm. think we should hold this up, but I, that, that's no, a pro that's a problem. Inclusive. That's yeah. a problem, and would be a problem in all of our policies. But maybe just to think about going forward. Mm -hmm. Just launching that off for the future school committees to look at. Yes, she I mean, or we can policy. we can we can, you know, crack the ceiling by starting it on this one. But um, that just occurred to me as mm -hmm. I was reading it. Anything I else? think the pronouns, is, I agree, maybe for a different day, but I think it's something that we should okay. consider. Bigger than this policy. It's bigger than yeah. this policy, yeah. but deserves consideration. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Are we, are we ready to vote? I would move to approve policy GCRD tutoring for pay. As amended? Oh, sorry, you did amend it. Yes, as amended. Okay. Second. Okay, all in favor? Yes. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that's unanimous. And that one is ready for posting. Um, and now we have school committee policy JH student attendance, which is also a second reading. And so this, oh yeah, so this is the conversation that we sort of got I meet on last time about illness in the family and do you want me to begin yes so first of all thank you for your feedback at the last meeting um, it did it did result in some very useful uh, conversation with administration and um, I 
reminder because one of the questions that you posed of me was what what, what does this really look like in practice? And I can answer. You know, I'm in a much better position. And Dr. Kavanaugh, please jump in, um, because she's been very much a part of all of these discussions with me. Um, the the reason that we wanted to add the chronic or long-term illness or quarantine, as opposed to the way it originally read, which was simply illness or quarantine, was to distinguish between the head cold or the 24-hour flu. Whereas in the handbook, in the student handbook, it says, in, as far as procedurally, please keep them home if they are infectious, if they have a cold. We, we don't want to, we want to discourage you from bringing them to school. Um, however, we are required by law to make sure that students come to school. So the policy is intended to provide a window that is more than sufficient within, as, as one of the principals reminded us, it's seven absences within six months um, for you to have a cold. It's unexcused, but you can have it. Nothing's going to happen. You, we want you to keep the, the students home, but we're not going to excuse it um, because they're not at school. And so the chronic or long term within the policy was to call out the reasons by which students would be excused um, typically, but not required by policy, would be that that would be accompanied by a doctor's note. Although not required, that typically would be the case. Or the school would be very much aware um, of the chronic illness. Um, Dr. Cavanaugh, could you describe that situation um, without obviously disclosing any in information, but the, the, a situation at the center school whereby all children really needed to be able to stay home with their flus and their colds? Oh, yes. So um, Principal Lauren DeBoe is describing a situation where a student in a particular classroom uh, may have um, something like a compromised immune system, right? And that can happen for a number of reasons. But if you have a child then who goes to school um, just getting over a cold, um, getting over you know, nausea and vomiting, then what they're doing is they're bringing into that classroom something that could really be damaging to a student with a compromised immune system. So she felt like it was really important for us to be able to say that in a situation where a kid had gotten, had, had no fever for more than 24 hours, we would typically let that student back into school. In that situation, if the mom called and said, I just need to let you know that, you know, I understand there's another student in the classroom with a compromised immune system and my child has been fever free for 24 hours, but I'm not sure how you feel about him or her coming back to school. In that case, Lauren DeBoe could say, I'm going to excuse that absence because I really would rather just you keep your child out one more day. So that's a situation where we say a principal then would use that kind of an authority to say, please stay home one more day and excuse the absence. We also talked about the chronic illnesses, things like hemophilia, diabetes, where sometimes you have to be out for treatment. I mean, that's something that we don't want to say, no, I'm sorry, that's an unexcused absence. Of course, it's excused, right? And very often, if you're having those kinds of treatments, they're happening in some kind of a clinic or maybe with like some kind of home hospitalization where somebody comes to your home. Those can easily be documented and then excused afterward. So that, that was some of the reason why we like to have the, the principal's knowledge and why we liked to keep the, the chronic piece in there as well. We also were seeking a consistency. So I think that um, I did hear from, from some of you, from a couple of you, um, and the consistency, the experience that, you know, at the lower elementary level, and particularly at kindergarten, it's not required that students attend school. So therefore, it's not required that you should bring a doctor's note. But then if I, or, or have an excused or unexcused, it really, everything should be excused. However, if that's the practice in kindergarten and now I'm in first grade within the same building, it gets really, it gets confusing. Um, and then if the practices change at Elmwood School and often, very, very often, parents have a child in each building. Mm -hmm. So which is the school that needs that, right? And so we, we feel that it's very important that when it comes to policy that there is consistency. This first came to light, or actually for the second time, because we did look at this back in 2015, um, that the student information system and the way in which we coded the absence um, was requiring us to have some different language around it. But as I had mentioned at the last meeting, we also, because we've really struggled with this, um, have reached out to our attorney 
um, who came in and, and came to to one of our administrative meetings because we have been really wrestling with this um, to say that we really the, we really do need to develop this we have have to follow the policy that basically says that these absences are not excused these are the ones that are excused um, what I like about your policy, the way that you, the language in this policy is that it does provide discretion. Mm -hmm. It provides, because as one of you pointed out, there is a lot of subjectivity to this. Um, and we do want parents to make decisions, obviously, um, for their own children. And only they can judge whether or not their child is well enough to come to school. And we don't ever want a parent to feel torn about whether or not to, to, to send a child to school. What we want to reinforce is that it feels like a negative thing to have an unexcused absence. <laughs> and it really is OK, parents. You are going to have unexcused absences. In fact, you, could, you may have up to 10. Um, and then even if, if you do have more than 10. Seven, um, I thought. Well, seven and six months. OK. So, okay. Right? Yep. So just depending on where that falls in the, in the school year, it could be more. So even within that, it, it, you know, the principals and the families particularly families that are dealing with health concerns in a particular year, they're going to know the families um, that, for whom this is really unusual. It does not say in this um, policy that, the, the, that you must report it to the attendance officer. It says that you may. Um, so the involvement of the attendance officer is also discretionary. Right. Uh, so I, a couple, couple things. One is it, it seems like from our conversation or, or email exchange that there is at least one school that does excuse by. Well, there was until okay, today. Well. <laughs> so I did not mean to. Um, we didn't say the wasn't name. wasn't necessarily what I was going for. I know. I, I guess I struggle with the, not the policy itself so much, but the practice on the other side of it of how many it, it, I don't how many kids are being penalized mm -hmm. in one way or another how are parents and children or does everybody automatically receive that letter when they hit that threshold mm -hmm. even though the school does have some knowledge prior to sending the letter out mm -hmm. um, for example they would have information that a child was dismissed by the nurse and things like mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's useful to get into nitpicky of mm -hmm. this day, that day, and the next day, mm -hmm. but to look at what the practice is on the other side of you've hit the seven unexcused absences. Yes. And I do struggle with that a little bit because it's treating somebody who's ill the same as it is treating somebody who's just gone to Disney World or, we, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. But that 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 is not my, my major concern is what the actual practice is mm -hmm. in how the families are receiving this is it consistent throughout the district I guess and is it our understanding is that it is um, our understanding is also that the letter that had had been um, the the response from families was that it that the letter was quite firm and quite um, there's a large discussion on social media last year about it but yeah. but our understanding was that it's been changed is okay. that have any of you? I, have not I don't want to put you on the spot and say you've gotten the, the letter. Four years. <laughs> um, but the the principals did take that under advisement and really tried to um, really share the letter as um, a, a for your information, right? And I would hope an invitation for a conversation, conversation. with the families Always. for them to be able to Always. look at to see mm -hmm. are these children who are in need of something to help them get to school like I think the example was a parent who couldn't get their child to school because you know a small Another child was sick they couldn't sure, transport sure. Uh, yeah. rather than a firm coming down on the, the mm -hmm. you'll do X consequence because you missed X number of days mm -hmm. without considering all the mm -hmm. specifics so that's yeah and I think today we also talked about um, you know if we're all sending the letter at the seven day point and you know that there's been a family where a kid's had strep, then had a bad head cold, then, you know, just a series of things. Because it does happen that there are some school years where you look at your health and think, wow, I can't imagine all of these things have happened, but they have. Um, just picking up the phone and saying, you know, i got to send a letter. I understand she's been sick a lot this winter. It's just perfunctory. You know, let it go. Yeah. That, I think, is a great practice. Yeah, we did talk about those kinds of mm -hmm. things, too. Mm -hmm. yeah. But 
I think also, and, and hopefully what this does, you, you talked about the importance of having the principal's discretion in there because they do know the families. But I think in some ways to, to continue to reinforce the two-way communication mm -hmm. so that the principal does in that case have that information before the letter goes out, right? So, so if you are having a particular challenge or if your child just happens to have a really bad winter, that, that parents know that they should reach out to the school. And mm -hmm. just just to give them a heads up on what's going on, to um, you know, make sure that they're that they're sort of consulting with them in that way. I, I think that that's that's important because I would imagine that there are there there are instances where this letter goes out where the parent just has not had that proactive communication. Well, the school genuinely doesn't know anything other than this kid has yes. been out of school a lot. Right. Yeah, well, and the I, school can only be proactive if the parent is too. Mm -hmm. right. yeah. Well, and I think that's where. It, I mean, you hope that you can get as many people proactive as you can, and I don't worry about myself or probably anybody in here at knowing the way it works and mm -hmm. who to reach out to when you're having trouble. But there are families that are newer to the district or who don't maybe understand, understand the lay of the land in the mm -hmm. same way. That's the language is strong, no doubt. Unexcused. <laughs> um, and your point about whether you went to Disney or whether you're homesick and you've, you're having a difficult year, um, it, that's hard. But it's not our language, right? right? So I think that's the. I mean, we we do really feel very strongly that that we're partners with the families in every way, and this is just another example of it. But the, but the other on the other side, not but. The other side of that is the requirement that we are legally obliged to make sure that kids are attending school and and to follow this policy. Um, so I think that that kind of addresses the discussion around chronic and long term and why we our hands are somewhat tied when it comes to the excused and unexcused language. Um, the recommendation about removing serious illness in the family and including that under the fifth bullet, which would be other exceptional reasons with previous approval of the school's principal, um, was tied up with and connected to also a discussion that we had with legal counsel. And this, one's, this one gets a little bit even more complicated. Um, and I have the language on my computer. Because what it results in is sometimes is students being withdrawn from school. So if there is um, a situation where a student is being removed from school to, say, travel with a family to go to another country um, where there is a serious illness in the family, that's the reason. It's not We're not going on vacation. Uh, we're going for this serious family matter. Um, the dilemma for the school department is that if a student is withdrawn, we have one of two choices. Um, one is that we know where they're go we, they are going to another school system. If they're not withdrawing from our school system and registering in another school system, we are not able to withdraw them under those circumstances. We're legally bound to ensure that we know where that child is. However, the dilemma becomes the educational piece. So if a school is, if a child is going to miss four to six weeks of school, it is my opinion that the school department is not responsible for their education. The, the, the family has removed them from our educational program. They're no longer attending our program. The dilemma is that we can't remove them, withdraw them legally if they're not going somewhere else. The only other recourse is for the parent to choose to homeschool the child, which is essentially what they're doing when they're removing the child from the system um, because of a family decision. And a family decision is a family decision. That's not a judgment in any way on the part of the school department. The, ju the, the, the um, problem of practice becomes if students are gone for that length of time, are still registered within our system, and we can't possibly continue to be responsible for their education during that time. And that means um, instruction and assessment to be able to be responsible for, and this is what we want to continue to discuss tonight, um, that it does seem unrealistic to expect a school system to continue to be responsible for students who are not attending their school. And I have some language to suggest um, including in the policy around this issue, policy JH. Um, but I can wait if you want to first discuss that, Jean. 
Does anybody have any other thoughts? So I, I have two things that I want to mention. So I like what uh, Nancy was talking about, is that parents, if they get to know that this is happening. So I wonder if there's any way to connect with Power School that once you reach, let's say, the five threshold, not wait till seven and say, five, you've reached five, you have two more, if something it, you, know, you might consider discussing with the school system. So an alert goes out. So at least from the school perspective, we have done our part in saying, try and talk to someone, right, ahead of time. And then you have still have a couple more days that if there is an issue going on, you're giving that opportunity. I, I do think it goes, the, the, the initial letter does go out at, at five days. The problem is if your child's homesick and they send it on day five, by the time you get it, it's going to be day six, depending on why the child's home. You've, and it also doesn't really change if your child's actually ill. Right. Hopefully it doesn't change. Right. Uh, but would it not, you know, go back to the discretionary aspect of it? And, um, you know, I, I guess when I was, you know, I had had a long conversation with Dr. McLeod on this. And she was again assuring more coming, that this whole policy is coming from the perspective of children's safety. And as long as they're in the school system, it's our... Um, it's our responsibility and that you know we have a joint responsibility with the parents but obviously if something is not right we need to report it right so that was one thought that so if it's already happening that's great I mean it would be great to have an email come out um, speaking to that uh, mm -hmm. I don't know the language of the day five letter does it come in mail or email I don't know how but it's done you know, now. specifics I, right yeah. so so something like that. Um, and the second one that you talked about, about the withdrawal, that if a parent does decide, they have that option to withdraw if that situation does demand that, right, their personal situation. Um, do we have a policy related to withdrawal, and can we just reference that back into uh, this? So the language that I have here is not policy, but it is in the student handbook at the elementary level and it reads like this students who will be out of school for extended periods of time parentheses one month or more should contact their building principal regarding withdrawal and re-enrollment procedures okay. um, in then in our meeting today we added the school district we added for your consideration the school district will not be responsible for curriculum instruction or assessments missed during this absence so the, they would be contacting the building principal regarding withdrawal and re-enrollment. And at that time, and if it were more than a month, uh, extended period, one month or more, the conversation then would happen to, to include a homeschool application um, because of what I said earlier around the legal requirements. If you're not actually moving, if you're still a resident in town, you live here, you're not going to be enrolling in another, in another school system. Unless maybe you are. Maybe there's an opportunity um, during an extended period of time when a child could be enrolled in a, in a program somewhere else. Um, and and that, would be, that would be great. Um, so that's there for your consideration. The language that we took, the first part of that came right out of the handbook. Um, the second was to remind parents about the responsibility around the, the student's instructional program that if you're removing them from the school district. And, and it's meant to reinforce that that means during the absence, including coming back, coming back after a month to six weeks, um, and expecting the school district to be prepared to catch the student up on what they missed is, is um, really not something that we can be prepared to do. So I, I like the language of that. I just had one, what, one thing jumped out at me when you say that it says a month or more. Yes. So the, the kids that aren't out for a month that are out for th three weeks mm -hmm. are Mm -hmm. Still in a whole nother violation of this policy, right? I, I don't. I'm sorry. I feel no, like I'm bringing no, no, up no. A lot you're not. I didn't. Things. I wasn't signed because of the question at all, Nancy. It was more. You're right. I mean, so this is where we we look at exceptions and reasons. And I want to impress upon the school committee 
the work that the school does to try to work with families who are going to be out for extenuating circumstances. And if it's a couple of weeks and you're going to be missing school work and, you know, teachers really do try as much as they can um, to work with families around this. And, and so the, the month or more, um, right, does leave, does leave some time in there that is beyond the seven days but now it's a month, and it, does it fall under the, the fifth bullet, exceptional reasons with pre previous approval? I mean, I wonder if that's where that. Well, in, in maybe best left vague like that for it to be considered on an individual basis. I don't know. Do you want to add any clarity? Or? No, I think the reason we chose the one month is because that's the way it was written in the student handbook. So we thought that we wanted just to keep them compatible. I, I actually personally like the one month and leave yeah. that a little open-ended and leave it to the discretion yeah. and have those conversations, right? And I guess uh, we do receive emails talking about, you know, children having to attend, make sure they attend. Um, and I, I guess just adding on to that, that if there is an issue, talk to us. I you meaning the school committee or the, the school administration? The, the administration, no, no. Oh, don't talk to me. Please don't. <laughs> please, please do not call. <laughs> right. So you know, if there is an issue, reach out to the school nurse or something to that effect. Do you mean right in the language of policy that I was just add add to this language right here? Mina? Not necessarily. Oh, oh, I don't know about policy. I was just thinking more when the letters go out. Oh, the letters. The yeah. Parents the letters or in the should, handbook. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm to attach um, information I was that. so if you look at the policy in front of you and we will clearly bring this back again yeah. um, what I was thinking would be to add this you, th th where we have the different sections that are underlined excused absences or tardiness denial of school attendance um, probably under excused absence there would be a new heading that would be extended absence with this additional language that would be new to the policy for yeah. for you to think about and the consider one month. Yeah. Or more that, right. That I mean, the piece about the school district's responsibility, I think that's something, you know, that that we need to be really clear on. Um, the option of homeschooling is something that there are a lot of resources out there now. There's so mm -hmm. much that can be done um, online, online options, yeah. absolutely, for families <clears throat> and, and resources that are available to them. So it sounds like we all would like to see that in the Come next back. version of, okay. the, of the policy. Are there other comments about the rest of the policy or are we pretty comfortable with where it is? I, I just want to thank Dr. McLeod and oh. her team for being so patient. <laughs> this is a this is a really important <coughs> discussion and, and clearly um, it clearly we, we are all working really hard to get it right. Yeah. And so I mean I, I think the the careful look you've done to compare all the handbooks with the policy and make sure that everything is aligned has been really helpful because I mean we change those poli those handbooks every year yeah. and you know we're just presented with track changes and we don't always stop to think wait a second is this in any of our policies mm -hmm. and probably that's where we've taken yeah. different forks in the road. Fair enough. So um, just one other question do we ever uh, reference handbooks Yes, and it's referenced on that okay, chart. I, I did see that on that on that grid right there. So, okay, are we ready to move along to the superintendent search? So we actually have a series of documents to look at here. Um, we definitely need to take a vote on the contract with NESDEC. Um, we didn't necessarily list a vote for everything else, but um, but there may be other things that we want to vote on. So why don't we? <clears throat> well, this is at the top of our, in our packet, so why don't we start with the contract, and does it make sense to turn over to, um, to Susan? Mm -hmm. Do you want to walk us through the magic that you did to get this under the, uh, <laughs> the threshold for us? Um, well, basically, uh, <clears throat> what we really wanted to do was kind of maximize the resources that we already have within our, our own school department, and uh, particularly the HR department. Um, so we went back and forth with NESDEC with what we can do and then what we consider to be add-on services of, of a consultant. And so that's where you see this, this contract is kind of um, shaken out where we're taking advantage of their reach, their advertising reach, their connections. Um, but we are preparing 
the profile and uh, the job description, if you will, um, the profile of the community and um, things that were already really done not that long ago. Um, so we're jumping off of what was already professionally done not that long ago and just updated um, and not having to pay for that again. Any questions or thoughts? Not I, at I, that number. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Now, I, I do have a couple of questions. So besides the 9,800 something mm -hmm. uh, number, I thought I saw a few for advertising which were adding up to 1,200. Did I do that math right? Well, we can opt for none of those okay. additional okay. advertising fees. I see. Okay. Um, but good. can I ask, but sure. you, it's along that question. That doesn't take us over the 10,000 threshold, the, the advertising, or no? Uh, if you were to opt for those, it that would. would. It, it's not separate. It's all, okay. Right. All right. Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, okay. so th that's okay. what, right? So okay. that's what, and because I felt like we do would want, I would think that we would want to advertise a little bit at least, um, but we'll. Um, but we can do that, we right? Can, we, we can do, do it. We can do that we ourselves. Pay for it ourselves. Right. So right. these these resources that are listed here, Kim can do that, and I then see. we'll pay for it ourselves. We're just not doing it through them. I okay. see. Yeah. I see. And and these um, were not high on Kim's list of where your candidate pool would be coming from. I see. Yeah. Okay. Um, the other question was the two people who are being assigned to us to help us out. Mm -hmm. have, we ever, have you ever worked with them? Do yes, we multiple times. Okay. So they have really deep knowledge of the district, and they are the two people that helped us find Dr. McLeod and Susan. Okay, so great. they're good at good it. Good track record. Okay. Yes. Right, um, those are the questions. So my question, just around the, the $10,000 threshold, is, does that only, is that the cap for their fee for their service? Or to, to Jen's point, if we start adding in some of the advertising options, are fees included in the $10,000? Yes, because it's, it's the cost for the total service. So, but in expenses, though, are also included with, okay. Okay. So, so that's, that's why we worked to get yep. both their consulting fee and their expenses. Okay below 10. So what we see right here is what we get. Right. But with Pretty the much. ability for Kim to do some other right, things. Exactly. Well. Right, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Plus we got $179 to work with. So we can go wild at the end. Um, $78.99. The coffee at the interview. It's a lot of coffee. <laughs> I just want to thank you for whittling this down to a number like this that we can manage. Well, and, and again, having... it really is a collaboration between you know, you have some great assets at, at the school. Yeah. So yeah, Kim Kim you know, did a really great maximizing job maximizing our resources together for us. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of the motion, do we also need to designate someone to sign the contract? Do you sign the contract? Um, you can designate for me for to sign to it. it. Okay. All right. So if if and when we're ready to make that motion, we could include that. Um, is somebody ready to make a motion to award the contract for the superintendent search to NESDEC in the amount of $9,821 and to authorize um, the Director of Finance and Operations to sign on behalf of this committee? So moved. Okay. And a second? I'll second. Okay. So that's a motion by um, Mr. Graziano, a second by Ms. Devlin. All in favor? Yes. 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 Any opposed? Okay. So, yay. Thank you very much, Susan, for taking care of that. Um, so now we can move on. The next item in our packet, which I skipped over and Megan had to remind me it was in here, is the um, application for the screening committee. So we had talked last time about um, the makeup of the screening committee and wanting to include some um, some representatives from the community, both parents of current students as well as um, at large mem an at-large member. So um, Kim did a great job, I think, putting all of this together so people who are looking at this application can see generally what the time commitment is, um, what kind of background we're looking for. Um, Kim will collect all of these for us. And then the other piece of this is that we need to designate when are we going to invite people to come in and basically interview them on TV, which 
would probably discourage a lot of people, um, but nevertheless. Uh, so are there any, um, Wait, can is I there any up? feedback so, on this? So when you say encourage people to come in so we can interview them on TV? Well, or before the meeting. I mean, I think we can't. If it's all five of us, it's in well, So that was going to be my question. So, I mean, I'm fine either way, but in the past, like I know for like the ESBC, we didn't have all five of us. We designated. We uh, that's true. Um, I think it was the chair and the superintendent. Okay. Um, so I, I don't, I'm okay with that, but to your point, it might be fairly intimidating to have people like a parent of an elementary school student come and interview with all five of us. Yeah. I'm, yeah, I we mean, could ask I'm, Susan how scary we are, but. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I'm open to, to however we want to do it. I mean, I, it's uh, it. You're right. I had forgotten that we did it that way for the ESPC. I just was thinking more in terms of you know when the board of selectmen is appointing people to boards and they have multiple um, applicants. They just, I mean, it's not like a formal grilling interview. That's scary, and we make them drive my car in the rain. But it's. Um, an opportunity for all of us to have an so I mean whatever is the rest of the committee's preference is fine with me so I would also suggest so I, I would say my lean would be towards the slimmer off-camera version okay. um, and one of the reasons too is because one of, one of the things when we do interviews as a group of five of us it does tend to become like fairly rote in terms of mm -hmm. who's gonna ask which question and we go around whereas I think we might benefit more from a conversational type of interview. So mm -hmm. okay. I think if we were to designate either two of us or one of us and Miss um, Pulnick, I, I don't know okay. what, what, but I, I think I think we'd get more candidates, and I think we'd have a better idea of what we're dealing with. Okay. Well, that sounds that does that work for everybody else? Yeah. Okay. Um, so now I have to look and see. Does it actually say on here that you're going to be interviewed? I don't think it does. Does no, it? No, I didn't see that. I don't okay, so so we don't have you to. You need to make sure they, it. they, in some way, they get the. I guess we can contact them. Well, after. we'll have to contact them when they all apply. So the deadline, um, the application deadline, is October sixth, and this eliminates the next question, which is when do we all want to interview them? Because it, it certainly opens up the flexibility for scheduling that. Um, a little right, bit more it doesn't easily. Have to be it doesn't have to be all of us. Right it doesn't have after to be posted, and right. it doesn't have to be a lot of things. Um, okay. So, any other thoughts about this application? Uh, I think the application is great. I think we just need to send it out to as many people as possible. Right. right. So, um, so that was yes. So that's the next question. How do we want to distribute this? Uh, I think what we had talked about with Kim was to distribute it through listserv, obviously, um, but also to try to put it in um, all the local media. And because we also are looking for people at large, um, you know, I think it would be great to. Uh, I can forward it to the Chamber of Commerce, for example. Yeah, I definitely think we should um, do that. So I think forwarding it to to the Chamber of Commerce, sending a listserv, putting it on HCAM and Hop News and um, Hopkinton Independent. The Hopkinton mm -hmm. Independent, which may be the deadline with today. You, you can, um, if we send it in tomorrow, we may be able to get it. hasn't gone to print yet. Would it go in? Would she put it in in this format, or does she need an article? I could ask her. Uh, okay, will you take that yeah. job? Okay. If so, I, could I get a copy of it? Megan must have the PDF mm -hmm. to send to me. Yes. Um, okay. How about so putting some at the senior center. Yep, we can I put can some do out. That. Put Perfect. some out at the senior center. All the Mina, the um, deadline is really soon. So no, I can go tomorrow okay. if awesome. I can get a few copies. Okay, that's great. Um, okay, so. I don't need that. I don't. I don't think we need to vote on this. But just in general, we're comfortable with the application. We'll designate one or two of us um, in in conjunction with Kim to review the applications and interview people. Um, why don't we have? Why don't we determine who that's going to be when we later talk about the rest of the committee, um, and then we'll get this all sent out as soon as possible. Tomorrow. Okay, so we're all comfortable with that. All right. So then, kind of going back to 
the makeup of the committee. We have, I think it makes more sense to talk about that next. So we have that in our packet as well. And um, do, do you think it makes sense to have the same two school committee members that will be on the screening committee do the interviews or would you pref I mean is that an opportunity for two others of us who are not going to be on the screening committee to to participate or is that just getting complicated I don't think it matters a whole lot I mean I think if there are separate people that are interested in doing it I think the increase to increase all right so voices would be good yeah. but if only two people want to do both things I think that's fine too all right well why don't we start with why don't we start with the screening committee and then we can go back to the so beginning. screening of the of the applicants no I'll start with this the screening committee okay. meaning there's two screening school the committees. candidates for the um, yeah. for the job for the job yes for the superintendent job right. not the screening committee job so um, so I do think that John had brought up as we're ending historically, the chair has done that. I think that would be an important. OK. Um, and who would and, like to join and me? So what I would offer is that given that the chair is going to do this and given that the chair and I have the same tenure to run, I will take myself out of it because I think the other person should be somebody who's going to be on the committee. Yeah, I agree with that. I would like the screening piece, I think, as long as no one else feels strongly. I'm happy to do any piece, but. To be on the screening committee for the candidates? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. I'd vote for you. I like, I would rather, I, I like <laughs> that part. Okay. Behind the scenes, read that part. <laughs> well, but this is also interviewing the candidates. <laughs> oh, okay. So yeah, so this. No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable You're good with that. that. Okay. That's fine. All right. And, um, okay. So, so Jen and I will do will be on the screening committee. So then the next question is who will review the applications from the community members and interview them and make the recommendation to the rest of us about who to appoint? Um, so for the applications, I think is not the concern, right? It was more the interviewing, right? So the initial, what we get, we might get 20. Would we be interviewing all 20? We would. Yes, yeah. if 20 okay. parents applied to be on the committee, we would have. We and would. it all happens at the same time? Oh, no, no. Okay, well, I one guess at a time. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Oh, I see what you mean. Yeah. Right. Wait like 20, 20 minute interviews in a day. That's a long, a lot of. I see what you're saying. Right, right. Yeah, I don't think we'll um, have 20 people, but. No. Mm. I would be interested in doing. doing I, actually, I would be too. Okay. So, do you, do, is that all right with the two of you, with the three of you? I'm good. Okay, so why don't we have Nancy and Mina can do that part with Kim. Okay. Um, and so that will be, and you can make a recommendation to us. So when are, when are our meetings? The um, ones where you're going to so be. So October 19th. So oh. we would need, right, we'll want to vote on um, on right. October 19th. To confirm them on the 19th. To confirm them. On, so as long as, so in, the applications are due on the 6th. So as long as between the 6th and a week prior to the 19th, you're able to um, I think yeah, meet with all the applicants yeah, yeah. and make a recommendation to us, then we're good. I do see a glitch or an inconsistency, uh -oh. but it could be just me. Yep. On the uh, screening committee, you are listing three parents, one of which is a CPAC member. On the application, you do not list that CPAC because member. It's not, well, we would yeah, seek it because we were going to make an invitation to CPAC to designate their own person you're yeah. not going to interview those no got it well I mean we that's what we had we had so considered um, that's how we did it last time we could open it up and add that onto the application but that's why okay it isn't on the application I think if we're going to invite a representative from CPAC I think we should let CPAC determine the representative. yeah so yeah. so that was the next part of okay. what what I wanted to talk about on the screening committee so we have we have decided a few concrete identified people and then other sort of categories. So at the moment, um, we've identified Kim, who is our HR person, um, then Susan, who is our director of um, finance and operations, me and Jennifer, and Megan, who is um, 
Dr. McLeod's executive secretary. So we also have decided that we want a secondary principal, an elementary school principal, and a special education administrator or educator. I think that we should just ask him to let them decide amongst themselves who would like to be on the committee, um, much in the same way that we're doing it for CPAC. Um, professional staff, we said an elementary and a secondary teacher. So again, I think if we can ask him to just put that out there to the teachers and let them decide um, who wants to do that, that would be great. Then CPAC, I could send, I could extend that invitation. Or who's our CPAC I'm liaison? CPAC liaison. Why don't you extend that invitation to CPAC and invite them to to nominate one person? Um, and just you can take the that same to their, language to their agenda maybe for September. Yeah. We just need to know by the 19th who that's going to be. It would be. be well before that. And you can take the language from the application about how much time commitment and all of that. Um, the at-large member of the community, that's through the application process. So Nancy and Mina will make that recommendation to us. And then a member of the Board of Selectmen, my inclination was to ask um, the liaison to the school committee, who's Brian Herr, and he has done this before actually with us. So. Mm -hmm. um, I can extend that invitation tomorrow. So does all of that sound okay? So I have one question. Would Dr. McLeod be joining the panel of? Uh, On the interview committee? Yeah. I don't think so. I think that might be uncomfortable well, for yeah. everybody. And the second uh, question, did we feel, I, I don't know, just looking at the list, and I, I don't have it in front of me, I felt, uh, do we have sufficient representation from the school administration front? Um, I felt like maybe we need a little more. Well, we, we, just we have two principals, um, a special education person, two central office people, so that's five. Um, of 15. Of 15. So that's like 30% of our. Yeah, it's a third of the and committee. Then, and, then two te and then two teachers, two teachers is really almost half of the committee. Okay. And then if you count that we're, Megan. we have our feet, and Megan is half the committee, and then yeah. if you count that we have our feet in both okay. the community and school uh, buckets. I also think while I, I, I like the makeup of, I uh, do like the makeup of this committee, I think it would be difficult to add at this point. I think we're getting yeah. to that threshold of an much. unwieldy committee yeah. if we go above We've added 15. two people every time we've done yeah. so <laughs> we have This stuff. job touches so many different uh, parts of the community, it's hard to, to draw a narrow boundary around it. But OK, so just to, to recap, I will let Kim know all of this tomorrow. But Kim will invite all of the in-school staff to self-select. Nancy will make that invitation to CPAC. Uh, Kim will send out the application. And Nancy, you'll send it to the um, Independent, I'll send it to the other media, or Kim can. I'll ask her if she wants to do that. And then um, I will invite um, Brian Herr from the Board of Selectmen, and I will also send the application to the Chamber of Commerce. Is that correct? And I'll send it to the Senior, senior Center. Center. And you'll make copies to the Senior Center. Okay. So I think that that was, did we leave anything out? So rough idea of finalist interviews, is that November? Yes, Kim's. Kim's handy timeline is in here somewhere. 13th mm -hmm. to the 16th. Oh, okay. I was I, only, I was looking at the NASDAQ one that just had, like, the arrows with the days. No, yeah. So, Kim, okay. Uh, right. Wow, you can read that's that? For the, that's for the 25 and under crowd to read Yeah, that. no kidding. It's, no, okay. I saw it on that's, the if that's okay. the, I, I just was curious oh, directionally, right. so that's fine. Yes. When, I'll look I'm at the calendar. The, the calendar. going to be busy. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it says November 13th to the 17th. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Thank great. Thank you. Yeah. So, okay. Um, along the timeline question, you know, we're almost to the end of September. Is October 31st, which or 30th or the 31st, whichever is the deadline for receiving the applications, is that sufficient time frame for the candidates? Uh, you know, do we think a one-month window is we, enough? We pushed the deadline, application deadline, back to October 31st. It was originally much earlier than that. Oh, is that right? You know, um, that's what we have said to NESDEC. I think once we have a meeting with them, if we need to be flexible, we certainly can. But it's definitely our goal. I mean, we'll, we'll absolutely 
ask their opinion about it, but I think the point that we were trying to convey to them is it's our goal to be out in front of this and out as early as possible. Um, so we don't lose candidates so to other districts candidates. before yeah. we've... There's a few of them okay. that are out there okay. already. I right. Yeah, yeah, I know. And if folks are looking, right. it won't take them four weeks to respond. It'll right. take them a day. Yeah, They'll that's what ready. I was That's what I was going to ask, right. too, from Dr. McCloud's point of view. Yeah, like, I don't think this is going to take... Yeah. Right. Well, and the people who are going to apply are already probably waiting for it to open up. Exactly. They just hit send as soon as they see it. It's not a secret that you're doing a search either. So everybody, yeah, it's out there. So along those lines, I have one other question. Um, so this is more for Susan, I guess, with NESDAQ. Do they do like something like headhunting too? It just sounded like it from the words that they Yes, would NESDAQ. Yeah. 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 Yes. Okay. That's that's pretty much what we're paying for is right. their network okay. and um, contacts okay. for that's sure great. so that we have a broad pool. And um, just, I don't think I mentioned this before, but Kim did tell us that um, she's been looking into a new sort of niche service that is um, has been very successful in helping to cast a wider net and attract more diversity in candidates. So I think that that was something that I'm not sure she's reached an agreement with them, but it's something that she was looking into because obviously that's something that's been um, that's come up a lot in the community. And so I just want to make sure that people are aware that we'll we'll be as inclusive as we can and that we'll cast as wide a net as we can. Um, so the other thing that I think we need to make a decision on, formal or otherwise, is we all sent our edits on this um, successful candidate profile to Kim, um, but now we have to do sort of the group edit together because we can't talk to each other offline. So she's done a lot of work <laughs> to compile all of the, um, all of the suggestions. Uh, this was one of the, what, this is what Susan was referring to before, that this is something that we put a lot of time and effort and money into before and is still primarily relevant. Kim has updated it. So um, my question is, are there other um, suggestions that you have or do you feel like this is in good shape now? I actually must say that I just loved the brief on qualifications. It was perfect. Good. It was precise and perfect. Now, the feedback that we gave, that was like on a two, three page document. Right. Right. But that I didn't see as something, or did I, I miss it? Well, you know why? Because when we were looking at it, it was this, it was oriented the other way. So this was, is the same yeah. document, it's just not the, it, it was, it was a trifold. So we saw it in that format, but this is the same. I thought it was, so it was uh, like a this. lot wordier than, than I, I think these are the same thing, just in a different Would format. These are the same, okay. yeah. Um, so what we did do to develop that document in the first place was a series of community forums that NESDEC facilitated for us. And that is one of the things that we said we did not want them. We didn't want to spend the money on their time to do that because we had done it so recently. However, um, what I wanted to put to the rest of you is in terms of community feedback or input on that document, do you want to send it out via listserv and put it in the paper and invite people to send comments to Kim or to me? Or do you feel like it's still reflective of the community conversation that we had a few years ago? What is the, so in the past you've had that precedence that you would open it up to the community? We did do that. Yes, we did do that the first time. Well, I was going to say, let's be careful on the word precedent, right? I mean, right. before we're the, not required before, right, before to do the it. search that preceded Dr. McLeod. I mean, we had the superintendent had been in this district for like 150 years. years. Mm -hmm. So, uh, like, I, I don't. I mean, it, it, this isn't something that we've done a lot. Mm -hmm. So, I, I think at the time, because of that, it probably made sense to engage the community because we hadn't done one of these in a long time. I personally feel like it's still very reflective and accurate of the, the community in the district and the things that we want to highlight. And 
of putting it out by listserv and inviting comments from the community um we would then probably have to come back and mm -hmm. vote it again. i mean we'll be putting this thing out in right we want to put it out there sooner than later okay. yeah yeah I, I think it's good to go i mean most people probably read our packet well right obviously yeah, and but it is, i mean it is worded in such a way that i don't think i mean there may be like you know nitpicky word changes here and there at right. the, the the gist the message of it i don't think will change no matter who well and I also think it's 2017 right, i don't right. think there's a lot of information in here that can't, possible candidates aren't going to get on their own yeah. i mean it's not you know yeah. it's, i think um if they can't use the internet that's a different we don't issue. want them right <laughs> we don't want right i think the more important piece of that is so thank you i just wanted to make sure that we were all on the same page and not just sort of make that decision independently but um, I think the more important piece of that in terms of the community is making sure that we will have forums with the candidate, the finalists, which of course we still will do, and that's included Definitely. in the services that they'll be providing for us. So, um, you know, that's where I think people really will want to come and weigh in. I hope they will, although hasn't proven true in the past. But. So, um, so Jean, back to this um, document. Like I was saying, I love what you have, what has been put together on the qualifications end, but I'm pretty certain that what was there earlier was like way more descriptive, talking about you know the job duties, etc. Oh, we et had a job description. Right. right. Yes. Right. That's not in the packet. Okay. That's um, what we I did review that, of. and Dr. McLeod reviewed it, and she assured us that that's what she what does she every did. day. So you're right. <laughs> we okay. did, but that's not that's not the job right. description. So that's where I thought that there was a lot of feedback that I had certainly provided to. Okay. Uh, and so I didn't know if we were looking to discuss this because this is perfect. Yeah, right? no. From my perspective. That, because that's going out, yeah, no, that, that's going out more broadly. Okay. Yeah. Doesn't talk about what a fun school committee group we are. No. It's no. Kind of, yeah. Okay, that part. That is a selling they point. They can sell that. They're not going sure. to work with Gene and I, so. Oh. So it's going to go oh. down. Oh. Dick. <laughs> Okay. And that we sit till this late, having um, fun, and missing ice creams. I know. <laughs> now the ice cream is off ice the Ice cream table. was a lofty goal. It was. <laughs> I, I knew that was a safe offer. She was offer. secure in making that offer. <laughs> all days. right. So I think that we've covered all of the topics on the superintendent on the superintendent search agenda. Did I miss anything? We're good to move on. Okay. So if anyone is here for public comment, they are a ghost. Okay. So we'll move right along um, to items by consensus. Is there anything that anybody wants to pull out for separate consideration? Okay. So, Dr. McLeod. The superintendent recommends the school committee move to approve the items by consensus as outlined below. So moved. And a second? Second. Okay. So a motion by Mr. Graziano, a second by Ms. Cavanaugh. All in favor? Yes. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Um, and I believe all that is left is to adjourn our meeting. So it is 1039, and I will look for a motion to adjourn. So moved. And a second? Second. OK. Uh, motion by Mr. Graziano, second by Ms. Barath. Any, um, all in favor? Yes. 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 Any opposed? <laughs> <laughs> OK, so that concludes our um, September 21st regular school committee meeting and our next meeting is October 5th, 2017 at 7 o'clock right here. Thank you. Thank you.